Good morning to everyone and everyone really warmly welcomed at the EuroHealthNet annual seminar on digital health literacy for Europe's digital future. My name is Moica Gabrielcic. I'm EuroHealthNet president and public health specialist at the Slovenian National Institute of Public Health. First of all, uh, I have to share with you some of the housekeeping rules. Sessions will be recorded. All speakers should please limit background noise by remaining on mute when you are not speaking and those who are not active, you will not be on the cameras. Uh, today, we are very happy to say that we have a live English French interpretation, which is available for all by selecting the globe icon in the main menu. You can find it on the bottom of your screens. We have had the German interpretation at the seminar last year, and we could try with other languages in the next years to come. But enjoy it this year in French. A question and answers will be held at the end of each session. So however, in the interim time, we strongly encourage you really that you are participating and that you engage or through questions and answers or through the chat. So we really encourage you to be, to be with us, to ask, to be curious, to comment on what you think. And uh, we like to have this event highly participatory and uh, most of, of uh, all uh, also solution oriented uh, so that uh, we can take our key learnings that we can apply in our own work in the next time. And finally, um, as we usually, as the organizers, ask everyone who is joining the sessions, you will be kindly asked to complete a survey at the end of the event. It's really essential to us because we would really like to know what do you think about the event, how do you find it, and what could we improve in the future. So that's all for the housekeeping. And here we are now with our seminar. As you can read in the beginning of our summary, digitalization is transforming public health, health system, systems and the health information we receive, as well as on the other hand, uh, how we understand it. And how can we navigate these changes in ways which leave no one behind? How can we in fact understand and react to what is happening? Because digital determinants of, uh, of health have been somehow defining are becoming an important determinants uh, together with the others which we are researching or which we know till now. Of course, digitalization offers a lot of very positive opportunities, but at the same time, we see the acceleration of the consumerism influence on lifestyle factors. Uh, we can see what's happening with the role models. Uh, we can discuss violence, addictions, different other topics, which will also be on the agenda of today. And as Professor Ilona Kickbush said a few years ago, health is determined where people live, love, work, and play, but also where they're Googling and tweeting. So that essentially we are changing our, our worlds, our realities, uh, whatever kind of real or virtual ones. So we are facing the structure agency dilemma, in fact, this uh, classical societal dilemma. And your health net started wildly discussing it at the European Public Health Conference 2018 in the plenary, which was really successful at that time. Um, we will be speaking a lot of different topics today, and I'm sure it will be very interesting. Uh, but whatever we do, I think that we have to be concerned of how to use the artificial intelligence, including the ethical concerns. So we would like also to highlight the Montreal Declaration. You will find the link to this declaration in the chat. Um, and as I said, whatever we do, we have to do that with the full responsibility. But now uh, we are here with our first keynote speaker. We are really very, very honored and happy that we have Dr. Natasha Azopadin Muscat with us. She's the director of the Division of Country Health Policies and Systems at the WHO Europe. So Natasha, really thanks a lot for being with us and looking very much forward to share with us how the WHO is responding to those challenges. Please Natasha, the floor is yours. 
Good morning. Thank you very much, Moitza. And indeed, the pleasure is mine to be with you today. And I congratulate you for always having such foresight. Indeed, you have just mentioned the wonderful plenary that EuroHealthNet had organized at the UFA conference in 2018. And again, today, you are really putting digital health literacy firmly on the agenda, particularly from the perspective of leaving nobody behind, which is one of the for the European region. And if I can have the next slide straight away, please. I will start first by focusing on a few numbers. And then when I speak about digital health, increasingly, I am always uh, speaking about the health workforce on one hand and the wider population on the other hand, because both of these are important. And finally, I will tell you about some of the actions that we are taking here at WHO Euro um, at the moment and that we plan to take in the coming weeks and months. And it will be very important for us that you as EuroHealthNet through your constituency also engage with us as we uh, take the next steps in this very important area, as you have rightly said. In fact, the European, the Pan-European Commission on Health and Sustainable Development, when it redrew the determinants of health as we see them in the light of the lessons learned from the pandemic, we can see that digital determinants of health featured there with the other traditional determinants of health. So if I can have the next slide, please. We know that roughly half the population um, globally use the internet and that 90% of these would have access to a mobile broadband network. We know also that half the population are social media users. And in the European region, practically three out of every four people have used the internet to search for health-related information. Next slide. Most people enter through search engines. So eight out of every 10 searches start through search engines. We also know that around 7% on a daily basis of searches on one of the main search engines, Google, are classified as being health related. But what happens if one actually Googles COVID-19? You will find around 4 billion hits. So of course, people are very confused where to start. And then we are also know that uh, in not always is this information the needed information. And in fact, for example, in a study that was carried out by a colleague of mine at WHO in the South American region, only 7% of official websites had data on the 10 top causes of mortality in their country from the national health authorities. So there's a lot of information out there, but we don't necessarily find what we are looking for. But it can also get worse than that because we know that around 4% of um, misinformation on H1N1 was available during the, on, on Twitter, and then around 24% misinformation through YouTube in the time of Zika, 55% Twitter misinformation on Ebola. And when we come to COVID, just under one third of the information out there is actually misinformation. So this is the starting point. But let's come now to the health workforce. The pandemic has really accelerated digital transformation. The way we deliver health services is now multimodal and multimodality is here to stay. What do we mean? We mean that it's a combination of face-to-face, -face, of mobile, of digital settings, of visiting people in their homes, of visiting people in their homes and connecting digitally with another provider. And this, of course, this is a, a brave new world. So we need to ensure that our health workforce has the skills that they require. But there's another bigger problem that we need to address, which is that the current supply of nurses, for example, across the European region is 
grossly insufficient to meet the demand. And every day we still see that health workers are unfortunately leaving the health workforce as they are tired, fatigued and burnt out. So the gap is only going to grow bigger. And here we must start looking in earnest at the role that, for example, um, solutions such as artificial intelligence can play and digital technologies in releasing time, in gifting back time to the health workers so that they can really spend it with patients and also in trying to use these technologies to fill the gaps that exist today and will grow further tomorrow. Next slide. Of course, we know that the human health professions are not amongst the uh, top professions that will face automation in the current years. But we need to find ways that we can use this automation to support our health workforce better, to enable them to go further to meet the increasing needs and demands. Next slide. And we know, for example, that AI, if used correctly, can help to remove or minimize the time spent on routine or administrative tasks. But we have also had, heard stories where digitalization ends up taking the health professions away from the time that they spend with their patients. So I think it's time to really put some very concrete measures in place to ensure that digitalization really works to improve access, quality and efficiency of health systems, that we really make use of the potential benefits whilst reducing the potential risks. Because one of the risks is that the health workforce actually does not take up the technology. It does not educate patients and users as to how they themselves can use technology to better engage, to be better empowered, to improve their own health. And now moving to the next slide to talk about digital health literacy in the wider population. And of course, this is a really, really wide topic. But let me start by saying, and can I have the next slide here, that our WHO Action Network on Measuring Population and Organizational Health Literacy, which will be sharing its preliminary results um, in a few weeks time. We hope that the report will shortly be published, but it has shown that amongst different countries, between a quarter and half the population surveyed has found difficulties in dealing with digital health technologies and digital health information. Of course, this varies very much depending on age, ethnicity, economic status, gender and power dimensions too. And here, one of the things that I would like to emphasize is that when we talk about health and long-term care sectors, we are really working with people who are more likely to be elderly, to be less educated, because the nature of the burden of disease is such that we find more disease in the elderly and in people with lower education, employment and social status. And therefore here we have a real dilemma because we want to use digital technologies, we want to empower people to use digital technologies, but in the health sector, we know that the people who are going to potentially benefit the most from using these technologies are the ones that often find the most barriers to access and use the technologies. And therefore, the traditional methods that may have been used in the wider population will not suffice. So can I come to the next slide, please? And what we know is that individuals who are highly digitally literate gain far more. And we also know that those who tend to have lower levels of digital literacy are losing really the opportunity and missing the opportunity to benefit the most. So coming now to the final part of my presentation, which is what are we doing as WHO? In 2019, we adopted a resolution on health literacy, and we have a draft European roadmap for the implementation of health literacy initiatives. Of course, during the pandemic, we have also 
uh, stepped up our work on infodemic management because this was extremely important. And we have also taken stock of the way digitalization has really been used to accelerate change going forward. And can I have the next slide, please? So in terms of proposed actions to improve digital health literacy, we are highlighting the role in all our policies and strategies. We want to promote health literacy friendliness. We want to ensure that health literacy helps us to decrease inequities and exclusion. And we want to make sure that we use the health literacy paradigm also when it comes to digital technologies, such that it's not only about working with the population, it's also working with the suppliers and the producers of the technology to make sure that this gap is really addressed and reduced. And can I come to the next slide, please? And over here, what I would like to say is that we have been working really across the whole organization to ensure that we have this project on risk communication and community engagement. We have also been working with partners beyond um, WHO Euro, and we have our flagship initiative on behavioral and cultural insights, which is also doing a lot of important work to help us understand better what drives infodemics and how we can intervene to ensure that we can have some influence and we have been working also with social media such as Facebook in order to be able to regulate better um, what information is available out there to make sure that people are less confused and have better access to the right information. Can I have the next slide please? What does this mean? This means that we work to detect early false narratives and malicious spreaders that we are also working very much, for example, on um, uh, inoculation through education, behavioral interventions and gamification. We're working also to improve platform algorithms and transparency and having uh, fast checking and online verification forensics. And I think that this is all going to be a very important experience for us going forward. We have also developed a chatbot together with UNICEF um, and it works in 20 languages across the European region and really helps us to offer up to date information on COVID-19 and vaccination, keeps track of trending issues using polls and a rumor reporting tool. And finally, what are we doing on this um, area? Can I have the next slide too? We've uh, produced a number of guidelines, training and tools. And please, um, we will make these resources also available to you and feel free to disseminate them further. Looking forward, where are we going? Can I have the next slide? We are developing a regional digital health action plan, which is likely to be the key item on our regional committee agenda in September in Israel. And tomorrow I will be presenting the concept note to our constituency, the standing committee of the regional um, committee in order to have their feedback. But I give you also um, a glimpse that basically this is made up of four key areas. The first area, of course, is about setting norms and providing technical guidance because countries are investing heavily in digital health, but they want to make sure that these investments pay off in terms of really improving the health of the population, decreasing inequities and improving the bottlenecks in their health systems. And therefore, there is going to be a big strand of work on working with countries to help them enhance, um, redevelop or further develop their digital health strategies in the light also of the lessons we have learned through the COVID pandemic. We will continue to work on building the right networks, particularly in emergent areas, such as, for example, when it comes to big data, and artificial intelligence and promoting dialogue and exchange very much also at a sub-regional level. And we have actually launched our first network in the Western Balkan countries, which will support the implementation of the Western Balkan country roadmap, which was launched by the regional director to 17 ministers 
of the Central European Initiative just at the end of last week. Why? Because digital health as a key determinant of health has to be part and parcel of any health roadmap going forward. And of course, we will continue our work really on horizon scanning, looking for solutions that can help us to achieve our goals of united action for better health for everyone, leaving no one behind across the European region. I invite you at Euronet HealthNet through your member organizations to walk with us on this journey as we seek to develop our action plan and then further to the development of the action plan to work with us also to be able to implement digital health that is really geared at meeting the needs of our wider population as well as the needs of our health workforce and health authorities. Thank you very much and back to you, dear Moitza. Thank you, dear Natasha. It was really a pleasure listening to you with such a comprehensive overview of what is the challenge, what you are doing, what are the next steps, and we are really very satisfied and happy and proud that we have uh, signed the Memorandum of Understanding as EuroHealthNet with WHO, which is offering a lot of opportunities to join the forces, to work together, because we really are facing challenges of, uh, of the century, I would say, or even millennium. Thank you so much for that and for being with us. Uh, but we are going on with our thank you. Thank you really so much, Natasha. Uh, we are going on with our program. So I am handing to Alison, who will be chairing the first session of today, the first of the three sessions. So please, Alison, the word is yours. Thanks. Thank you so much, Moitza. Good morning, everyone. And thanks once again to Natasha for the wonderful keynote remarks. They did very effectively set the scene for today's seminar. Um, so it's, my name is Alison Mawson, and I'm a program manager here at EuroHealthNet, uh, the European Partnership for Health, Equity, and Wellbeing, uh, if you're joining us for the first time. And it's my pleasure to moderate our first session of the day on person-centered digital ecosystems. And the aim of session one will be to address the importance of a truly person-centered di digital ecosystem and to showcase good practices for implementing such a system or things that we need to keep in, uh, in consideration for such a system. And digital ecosystems aim to put people at the center of integrated health and social services with the purpose of delivering multidisciplinary and collaborative services across health and social sectors. Digital ecosystems present an opportunity for people to have easier access to their health data and better navigate the system. But this is assuming that the system uh, is adapted to people and that people aren't always having to adapt themselves to the ecosystem. How do we make it accessible and understandable for everyone who would be using it? So today we're going to be hearing from three experts who are coming to us from the European M Health Hubs represented, rep representation um, in Andalusia, from Estonia, a world leader in digi digitization uh, and the e-Estonia briefing center, and from our Euro Health Net member, Public Health Wales, uh, who have recently published a very nice scoping review that we'll discuss today. So again, as I've mentioned in the chat, um, please feel free to send us your questions, your comments. Uh, we really want to hear from you. Uh, we think that the success of today's seminar will largely be gauged by how interactive it is and, and how much each participant comes away from the session feeling that they've learned something that they can apply to their day-to-day -day work, uh, some sort of tangible action or solution. So please do write us in the chat or send your questions via the Q&A. Um, we will not break in session one until the end for a formal Q&A, um, but we will be collecting your questions throughout. So please uh, don't be shy. Um, and uh, with all of that said now, uh, I'm very pleased to hand the floor to our colleague, Belen Sotillos Gonzalez, uh, who is Innovation Officer at the Andalusian Agency for Healthcare Quality and a representative of the European M Health Hub. Belen, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Alison. Uh, and thank you to the organization for inviting the European M Health Hub and the uh, team from Spain. I will start my presentation right now. Um, don't worry, I, I have several slides, but I will focus on the on the most important ones. Um, we started to let's see. I am now putting the 
Just one second. Yes, I cannot. Okay, I will start in this way. Also, I know I I am not able to to put it on present on PowerPoint presentation. Anyway, um, if you click on F five, it should put it okay, in PowerPoint. Okay. Thank you, David. Okay, thank you very much. Um, you may know us because we we started uh, around the end of 20, uh, 20, uh, 2018 and uh, let me just share a, a little bit uh, about uh, what we, we will present today. Uh, I will make a quick overview of what is the hub and I will focus on a few AMS that, that we have been working on because we have several um, several elements in our work, but I will focus on ethics uh, in tradition to some work that we have developed with some uh, selected countries and also uh, on a knowledge tool that we have developed on diabetes. And finally, I will let you know where you can find other, other content. So to start with uh, who we are and what we do, this is uh, an um, European project. Uh, we have uh, a website with all the information and also a promotional video. This is a joint uh, collaboration. Uh, it started with ITU and WHO, uh, which colleagues I am glad to see uh, here today uh, with the headquarters of both ITU and WHO. And uh, we, as the Asian Regional Ministry of Health, uh, came into Exin also with uh, other 17 partners. As you can see, uh, the idea was to, to put together people from different uh, angles uh, on digital and mobile health, from governments, healthcare systems, the sector, NGO, and academia. So we have uh, 17 partners from around uh, 12 different countries. The main goal to summarize of this hub is to, to share knowledge and to foster innovation, specifically in M-Health, because the program started when M-Health was one of the main concerns. We know that now uh, things are evolution faster to artificial intelligence and other elements, but there is still a lot of challenge uh, when it comes to M-Health uh, deployment, especially at large scale. If you visit our hub website, uh, you, will, you will be able to see that we have uh, these different uh, areas. We have worked on how to assess uh, them health uh, programs or solutions. Uh, we have done the what we call the knowledge to one. We have worked also on, on ethics that you will see, uh, on policy, on the, how to support different countries. Uh, within the project, we have done something uh, not not uh, covering all the countries, of course, but starting with one or two of them that I will also explain. And we have also work on how integrate M height into health systems, not just like uh, small initiatives, but going to the heart of the high care delivery. And we have also explored a little bit on evidence that is um, a big concern. So we have put some resources there, right? Um, here you can see the differences that we have done. So I, I will start with the with the first one that is uh, the ethics, right? Uh, in ethics, uh, what we have done is um, there are not like magical recipes, but we have done a kind of compass uh, the, uh, about uh, what should be considered when you are uh, providing MHEAD services, right? So based on four big uh, principles that you can see here, transparency, agency, accountability, and equitable access that are uh, some of the foundations of, of uh, ethics uh, with authors like uh, Bichamp uh, and others, uh, how to navigate through this. So uh, within each of these hidden, uh, we have developed uh, some consideration like material access or social accountability or autonomy. So uh, if you go through the through this quick guide, uh, you will see different AMS that will help any provider to, to make questions, uh, to post questions about uh, what to put the focus on, on and what kind of things to, to solve. Regarding uh, person-centric, we have some elements, for example, in access or in usability. So of course it is there everywhere. 
And also uh, we have developed AI annotated bibliography that I invite you to visit in the website and to, and to enrich if you wish with some other contribution. And of course, uh, IETA Annex on GDPR. So um, this is the main thing about ethics. Uh, on the other hand, um, another part of the project was uh, to start working with some countries uh, that need to, to move forward and to foster on this uh, the, uh, mobile health. The COVID was a challenge for us in the sense that um, health ministers ha had to cover very big priorities, but anyway, we we, we manage uh, and, and we have been working with both uh, Czech Republic and with Hungary. Of course, also we have done activities with other countries or different uh, hub talks, seminars, etc. So uh, we have developed a kind of uh, steps and uh, as you can see, uh, sorry, because maybe it is a bit small, uh, the, the co-creation of user personas and service scenarios has been a big step in some, in, in some of them. These two countries have different uh, contexts and different situations, so we have had to develop different strategies, right? Uh, also according to their maturity. Uh, in Hungary, uh, the, the infrastructure is a bit more um, set and they have some, some work done. And in Czech Republic, we have uh, go further in other elements, <laughs> like funding and reimbursement. Uh, with this now story, I just want to focus on the Janos, um, on, on the Taylor approach. Uh, we have developed a profile according to their needs and we are still working on them. And on January, we will have the report, uh, mainly on uh, preventive care of, of diabetes. So we have started from the ground and seeing their needs, uh, et cetera. And uh, finally, just uh, let me to, let me show again uh, the different area areas we are working on, and also we have developed uh, the the hub talks where you can see uh, the the videos and everything is there, so you can see everything there. Thank you very much, and happy to to discuss with you in the Q and A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Belen. Very enlightening and a lot of work to cover in, in a very short time, I know, but I, I'm already quite curious to discuss more the consortium and, and how you brought together all these different sectors, because I think that that's something that all of us could be learning from, how, how to build these very uh, dynamic uh, multi-sector consortia. And these are really the people we need involved for this kind of work. So it's, um, I hope we have some time in the Q&A. Um, but to make sure we do, in fact, have that time, I'd now like to pass the floor to our colleague Annette Numa, who is Digital Transformation Advisor at the eEstonia Briefing Center. So thank you so much for joining us, Annette. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Susbo, and I'm very, very happy to be joining you uh, from this very snowy uh, Tallinn, Estonia. And uh, as introduced already, so I'm working as one of the advisors when it comes to digitalization. And obviously, when we think about digitalization, then the medical sector uh, is something very essential that also needed the, the help of technology in order to make this um, entire medical system here more efficient and provide the better treatments to people. And Estonia has been very successful by implementing uh, all of these solutions uh, for more than 20, uh, 20 years. Um, so I will make an introduction. Uh, where did we start? Where Estonia currently is uh, with e-health solutions and also uh, what are the uh, directions also for the future? Uh, because I can tell you that um, even though we already use technology in, in, in so many different fields and, and, and the medical sector, there is still much, um, much more to do. And, and I will give you a little glimpse of this as well. So I will be sharing my screen in a very quick second and we can start um, jump to the very first slide here. So I just wanted to put it slide also here just to draw you a picture because as you might have heard, Estonia still stands as one of the most digital countries, especially when it comes to the public sector. So today we already have 99% of services functioning fully online. One of the reasons that also we've been able to put all of these medical services online is that Almost 20 years ago, we already introduced the electronic identity card, which is very essential for people to also access their medical services and, and get access to all of the prescriptions as well, because uh, all of our prescriptions are issued um, by the online method so that we can, we can buy them uh, with our uh, electronic identity cards. Um, one also very essential thing about Estonian medical system uh, and how do we store the information between different 
uh, hospitals and, uh, and medical service providers is that we are not centrally storing anything. <laughs> but what we actually do is that we uh, de have decentralized the entire information and distributed this between thousands of uh, institutions and, and again, the medical service providers and hospitals. So there is not a central database, which we think that this is the most secure way to go when it comes to, again, uh, the data protection and uh, avoiding the attacks to the system. And even um, when it comes to making the system more secure, and Estonia is also the first country who uses blockchain on a national level, and, and blockchain is very, very uh, widely used, of course, also in our medical sector to provide the integrity of our uh, healthcare information too. And besides this, um, I think everybody can agree with me here that when it comes to your uh, medical records, uh, this is one of the most, um, I would say, secure and uh, sensitive information that you really want to keep secure. Um, so that's why also Estonia has taken one step ahead to make this so transparent so that every single time there is a doctor or a medical service provider, we can even see when they have been looking for our, our information, our data. So there is data tracker so that I can see which hospital, which doctor, at what time of the day, which part of my information have been looking for. So again, to really build this trust between the patients and the doctors and showing that Again, you can sleep peacefully at night knowing that we really store your information in a very secure way. But uh, I also wanted to uh, keep that slide here to draw you a little more realistic uh, overview so that if, if uh, different countries think that it was just like this to Estonia, so that overnight we had everything ready, then that's not true. Uh, it took us a lot of time to start preparing, first of all, the infrastructure, because I always say, Building a medical system is like building a castle where the fundamental bases are, are uh, first of all, the infrastructure, uh, having uh, very confidential access to your information, which means identity card, and then of course also an efficient data exchange and the integrity of, uh, of, your, of your information. So uh, since 2001, we have had this the extra system, so uh, a platform where that helps uh, different kind of hospitals to exchange the information then the identity card a year after we can sign also documents which again is important when it comes to prescription side um, then in the year 2008 uh, we developed the e-health system and uh, two years after we uh, started issuing all of our prescriptions online so since uh, 2010 and, uh, and today, uh, luckily, it's not only possible to buy prescriptions and medicals uh, from Estonia, but we also have cross-border collaboration with a couple of other countries, so that today I can travel to Finland, uh, get my prescriptions with my Estonian card also from there, and then also people from Portugal and Croatia can travel here and get access to their medicals with their uh, local uh, identity cards also from our pharmacies there. And this is what we really tried to, uh, like, try to push Europe to do, uh, is to have this collaboration on a cross-border level because we can have a free movement of data, uh, we can have a free movement of people and goods, but we don't have a free movement of, of the medical data, which should be the most essential thing that when we think about this for a second. Uh, but where Estonia stands today, so we have 99% of our medical information fully accessible online. 99% um, of our prescriptions are fully issued online so that I really don't remember uh, the time that I would have anything written on paper when it comes to my prescriptions. And then, of course, when something happens with you, then our ambulance can easily access uh, the most essential information about you, your blood type, your uh, what you're allergic to, if you have any kind of sicknesses they should be aware of. Uh, or, or again, just some essential information that they would be able to give you the best treatment as, as, as fast as possible. Uh, but, uh, but some other things that are very, very important when it comes to the medical sector, as I mentioned already before, building the trust side with the data tracker. But besides this, Estonia also is providing uh, the citizens a solution so that we can, if, if there is a summary in our medical platform, we can choose either to opt in or opt out. So if you feel that one of your um, visits to the doctor was too sensitive or you would like to have a second opinion from another doctor, then you can easily also opt uh, out uh, this summary and, and you will be the only person who is able to see this part of your doctor visit. And when you think about this, you will be never able to do that on paper. Um, so, so that's why it's an amazing chance to uh, give our citizens a chance to decide uh, which part of their information they want to be covered. 
And, and of course, the access on the data is on different levels. So there is around five different uh, levels of uh, access to the information. So obviously, your doctor, your um, uh, school doctor is never able to access as much as information as, as some of your specialist or family doctor that need much more or your dentist. So it's divided on, on five different levels. And again, transparency part is the most essential thing to really make people to use medical services online. And, and we can even write the uh, state of intention. So when you would like to uh, donate your organs, you can easily do that as well. So this is also very, very simple. Um, very, very just quickly also over, over the data exchange side so that uh, um, it's, it's kind of like covered also on so many different levels, the um, time critical data, the summaries, hospital visits, the medical images that are exchanged. Then, of course, also nationwide when it comes to the prescriptions or the ambulance or drug to drug interactions. But of course, one thing that maybe people might not think of, but it's also the cross sectoral services. So when, when, for example, you need the health declaration or work capacity, uh, also we can we can do that. Or if you need to update your timing license, you can get access to your medical information and and allow these portals to also access this part of your information. And then very quickly, uh, not to go over the time here, also the future plans here. So we are currently working on a personalized medicine system, meaning that we have been collecting 20% of our uh, citizens data, team data. And, and right now it's time to start analyzing this, giving feedback for people, because we know around 50% of our sicknesses are depending on our genes and 50% of the environment so that we can change this environment kind of. And, and, and then people can be more aware of their um, medical situation as well. And then of course, also in the future, our doctors and even decision making uh, decision makers from the politician side can really focus on the uh, on this information and see what are the most common sicknesses that our or diseases that our people are suffering. Can we change something in our habits? So this is what Estonia is currently really working on. And, and of course, also, if your doctor is giving you the prescriptions, they wouldn't just randomly give you one of the prescriptions, but would give you the one that really works on you based on your genes. Then, of course, AI will be essential uh, for, the, for the medical sector. Uh, we do also provide proactive services. We already ask automatically people in different kind of risk groups to come for the checkups if they haven't been to the doctor. Of course, also, we uh, provide remote verification so that you can uh, today also use the telemedicine methods to have Sometimes also conversation with your doctors remotely or different specialists can talk to each other and exchange information also very easily. So, so this is pretty much where we're moving to, to have everything done remotely and, and much more, again, more personalized and using AI technologies to make this system running much more smoothly, fast and efficiently. Um, so, so this is pretty much the plan for Estonia. So that was just very quickly. I could talk about this for at least the entire day, uh, what we actually do. But uh, I would say that if we share and organize this kind of events that also that we have here today, we can share the best experiences. And, and I would say Estonia really does have a lot to share uh, with some success stories and failures in the medical sector. Um, so um, yeah, I hope you, you have already a couple of questions also for the panel session as well here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Annette. Yes, really, again, such a rich experience. And I think um, uh, it's really wonderful that Estonia has put so much effort into making sure that you do share an exchange uh, on lessons learned, because uh, 20 years already is quite a long time to, to have been, um, you know, I think there was a lot of foresight. And hopefully that has been um, all very useful to, let's say, useful or um, has really yeah, given given the country uh, a bit of a head start for dealing with uh, COVID, for example, and and all of the effects that the pandemic has had on needing to suddenly shift to more remote services or more a uh, digital uh, approach. Um, and I think we'll hopefully come to it in the um, in the Q and A. But I know I would be interested to hear more as well about the integration with other services that are being provided, as we know that so much of health is not only in the healthcare sector, but really related to our, our social determinants of health or an, our environmental determinants of health. So it'd be quite interesting uh, in the Q&A to, to talk a bit as well about how you link not only across the healthcare system, but really with other, other social services. So thank you so much. Um,
So I'd now like to present our final speaker for session one. And again, I'd encourage you, we've had some questions coming in through the chat about the PowerPoint presentations and whether they would be shared, um, looking for more information on the different projects. So please do continue to send your questions. Um, we're happy to receive them. Um, and uh, for now, I'd like to present our final speaker, uh, Alicia Davies, who is the Head of Research and Evaluation at Public Health Wales. So Alicia, Thank you so much for being here. The floor is yours. Many thanks, Alison. I'm very pleased to be able to join you today. Um, my name is Alicia Davis. I'm the Head of Research and Evaluation and a consultant in public health based in Public Health Wales um, in uh, the south of Wales in Cardiff. Um, I wanted to share with you some um, reflections on work that we've been doing um, before COVID and actually what it means post COVID or during COVID and um, for digital inclusion or exclusion and health inequalities. Um, I've got some slides here. I'm just um, going to share the right thing. Um, so Wales, like many health and care systems, um, has uh, uh, increased its focus or, um, within its plan for health and social care to try and deliver a user-centred care, but making the most of both digital and data um, and, and digital driven platforms, bringing in some of that innovation to try and give people and um, more empower people to control their own health and well-being, um, particularly using digital, digital systems. But how can we embrace digital health but also make sure that we're not um, creating a digital inverse care law. The Tudor Hearts inverse care law is, of course, those that are most in need of health um, support for their health are those that are less likely to have equitable access to care and systems for health. Well, if you bring in a digital platform into that, can digital become a driver actually of widening the inverse care law in, into the uh, 21st century. So in Wales in 2018 actually we carried out a national household survey of all adults aged um, 16 plus years of age. Um, it was Alicia, support. Yeah? I'm so sorry to interrupt. I, the slides are not moving ahead um, and it's not oh. yet in uh, presenter mode. So. It's not in presenter mode. It wasn't yet in presenter mode. Oh, it is here. Sorry, Alison, let me try again. No, no problem. Hold on a second. Maybe it's because I'm on a one screen. I'm not sure if uh, David had suggested uh, previously think... the F5 button for Berlin. I'm not sure if that would work see. if you open the presentation again and, and hit F, F5. F5. No. The problem is if I'm presenting, I can't get back to the screen that you are on. I, I can share for you if needed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, isn't that? Um, but you are now not presenting. So my... Did you talking about digital health? And I can't get the slides to move forward. Um, that's very apt. Right. Um, we were on the th uh, second, third slide. Um, I'll rattle through. So we did a survey. Um, and uh, bearing in mind this is um this is in 2018. <clears throat> But you, um, from the survey, the reports and the and the links are in the PowerPoint. About one in ten um, people in Wales had no access to the internet at home, um, and um, the, the 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 
on the left hand side you can see there's a bit of a map there the darker areas means um higher proportion of the population do not have internet access at home and you can see that biggest the biggest purple area is actually the most rural areas of wales so some of that is driven by infrastructure but actually increasingly recently there's more of a drive to also consider data poverty as becoming um uh, an important barrier to having internet access at home or mobile internet access so why is that a worry for health inequalities? Well, the bars on the right show you that actually those that have uh, lower self-reported general health, low mental well-being, um, uh, take part in more health harming behaviours, so smoking or consuming um, higher levels of alcohol, are the groups that are more likely to not have internet access at home. Um, so the, there's a relationship between digital inequality and potentially health inequality. Sorry, next slide. What we also asked people to report was how do they use, of those that are um, online, how do they use the internet to enable them to uh, look after their own health, support their own health? And two thirds of those that have access to the internet um, were using that technology to support their own health in many, many different ways. And some of them are listed there on the right hand side, from looking up general information related to health to trying to find out information about health services, activities, so sporting clubs, that type of thing to support um, physical activity, mental well-being as well, um, and emotional support, and also to self-diagnose, so to check symptoms. But again, if you look at uh, how that pattern differed by demographic groups and, and health groups, you can see that actually it's more likely to be women, more likely to be younger age groups, but not entirely. There's about one in four 70 plus year olds were using technology to support their health in some way. And, um, and uh, less likely to be um, those in low general health and those with health harming behaviours. Sorry, next slide. So um, that was before COVID. Um, and some of that is driven by access. Some of it is driven by engagement as well, and also digital literacy. So now in a digital era, the challenge is that, sorry, if you click again, sorry, David, that um, COVID has really propelled this kind of digital revolution or the fourth industrial revolution at warp speed, really, over the past 12 months. And what's happened is that we've um, been forced, society's been forced to um, have a much greater digital front end to many, many different social support services. Um, and, and actually, it spans across all the wider determinants of health, as Dalgan and Wetgred's um, wider, uh, wider determinants rainbow. So everything from employment, working conditions, education, access to health services, even access to food at some points, um, ordering food and resources online. So what does that mean for health inequalities then if we look beyond actually digital exclusion as a barrier to potentially health being able to um, support health but actually to uh, have an impact on all these other factors as well too so the next slide so in a recent scoping review um we were looking at actually what's the impact of digital exclusion on health and how can that have a have an impact and then um, as i've just talked through it can have that direct impact on health where in that dark blue side on the left hand side there's lower or less timely access to digitally delivered services be that healthcare services health related information think how rapidly the covid information was coming through on a digital platform if you weren't on digital um, how, how are you getting that level of um, information and clarity of information and different forms of support both formal and informal again in covid a lot of the um, community support systems we've done some work looking at how the community responded to covid and actually a lot of that informal support was really facilitated by online um, WhatsApp, Facebook um, groups, so how to link in with those. Then digital exclusion can have an, impact, an indirect impact on health, lower, less timely access to social support services, limited access to education. Again, COVID pushed a lot of education in Wales onto online systems. 
um, access to housing, employment opportunities, being able to work remotely, and of course, um, higher cost of uh, non-digital services in some instances. So all of those factors can have a direct impact, but also an indirect direct impact on the psychosocial stressors, stressors on health. So that you have two downward forces in terms of inequality, inequalities in health and well-being. But actually, we already have existing inequalities. Um, so differences by age and gender, ethnicity, deprivation, rurality, data poverty. So digital exclusion has the potential to exacerbate um, underlying inequalities, which is really of a concern. So how do you prevent some of this? What can you do to try and um, mitigate some of that? So next slide. How can you stop uh, or make sure that a digital revolution has equitable benefits? I think it's the biggest question that you need to bear in mind in, um, in any type of digital innovation. How, how is this going to be equitable? How can everybody benefit? What do I need to do to make sure that that's achieved? So next slide. Um, in the review, the, the um, unlocking digital exclusion, there's kind of three core streams that um, that came through from this. This is a review, again, that was done um, uh, just about eight, two years ago. I think we published it now. So um, bear in mind, things have um, moved on. But actually, these three core elements are, are um, very relevant today as they were before. So there's access, engagement, skills and literacy. Um, and we tend to think about addressing these three challenges in terms of it being a, a challenge for the public. How do, we, how do we help the public to engage in these platforms? But actually, we also need to support professionals. If we want a digital revolution in healthcare systems, well, then we need to support healthcare and social care staff to be able to work um, efficiently and effectively on digital platforms. So the next uh, slide. So in terms of access, um, when you think of access and people think of access, tend to think of infrastructure developments and that is progressing, it's progressing here in Wales, there's innovation or, or op, um, opportunities to um, look at local provision in local communities, provision of free Wi-Fi within NHS settings and um, those types of uh, barriers to try and address, uh, get it, so we're resolving those barriers to addressing challenges with infrastructure. But actually, um, a bigger barrier may well be the affordability of technology and the affordability of data. Um, now, the Nesta group in the UK did an excellent review looking at data poverty for those who are interested. Um, and that's where you um, individuals are having to balance the cost of data, so um, access online, with uh, debts, um, heating, food, um, other budgetary challenges um, in a household budget. And that could well be a, a big barrier for the future is the, the data. The second um, and most commonly, there's a lot of work in here on skills and literacy, a lot of um, emphasis on training, on providing ongoing support once you've got someone online onto a digital platform so they can help to navigate around. There's lots of skills frameworks and some of those are in are in the review and lots of initiatives like trying to support digital heroes, digital champions and um, befriending systems and digital companions. The um, my my challenge really with with a lot um, of that is that we're not really sure to what extent that's helping to um, address some of those barriers. So are you really engaging with those that would probably engage with digital platforms um, uh, given time? So what, what, to what extent is that making a big difference? Um, and then that's the skills and literacy and the access, but actually a big challenge is, is just engagement and complete not interested in getting um, involved in digitally delivered services or accessing services in that way. And we do need to bear that in mind that um, digital is not for everybody. But one of the, um, a few of the, th the things that need to consider in that box is actually what are some of the contributing factors to that lack of engagement? Is it because of lack of skills and confidence? Well, then maybe we can support in that way. Um, understanding and bringing in some of the elements of behavioural science into how we develop apps 
or digital platforms. So that is engaging with um, with the the, the uh, target audiences or the users. And I think a key element here is about the co-production. So we need to develop digital platforms and digital tools that are actually solving problems that patients and the public want to be want to um, be solved so that it makes a difference. It's all great to have a fantastic new bit of digital innovation, but if nobody uses it and it wasn't co-produced in a way that um, your users can access and engage it, well, then it's, it's um, just not going to be helpful. Um, the uh, next slide. Alicia, I'm I'm just yep. conscious that we're we're running short on time, unfortunately. Oh, sorry, so, yeah, I'm nearly no, finished. No, no, <laughs> I was waiting for no, you no problem. to pop up. Um, so, so yeah, evaluate is the key. So then the next one. Um, in the development, in the review, uh, the the co-production is just bearing in mind that actually the co-production will be different for different groups. And um, these were some of the themes that were coming out from in, in the scoping review on di um, uh, technology for different types of, of groups or population groups, and actually some of the reflections from other studies um, that you might like to consider. And then last one. Yeah, so this is the last slide. I've just put in here a couple of other tools. There's a digital inclusion guide for health and care in Wales developed by Welsh Government and the Informatics Service, which has lots of useful information for digital for health and care services. Um, in Wales, there's um, this is in December last year, but a real push towards looking more digitally confident and reflections on what COVID has meant for that. Um, and then um, the last is the Digital Communities Wheels, which is a big programme in Wales funded by Welsh Government to support digital innovation um, for health and wellbeing. And they've got five, set five aspirations there um, that you can see them about in embedding digital inclusion, mainstreaming it, addressing data poverty, prioritising skills and um, and work underway about setting a new minimum digital living standard. So there's some of the other um, elements and, and links that might be useful to listeners. And that's me finished, Alison. Thank you so much, Alicia. And if we could also bring the, the cameras for our other two presenters from session one um, in a sort of gallery mode. Let's see if hopefully they come up. Um, but thank you so much again, just so many resources. So I'm really grateful that everyone uh, has, uh, will share their presentations that we'll be able to put them on the Eurohotnet website. And everyone who's with us this morning and those who wanted to be with us but aren't will be able to access this information and, and click on the links and, and use their digital skills to, to engage with all of this. I thought there are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, some of them are quite practical related to uh, e-Estonia and, and how you, um, these uh, cross-border prescriptions. So perhaps, uh, Annette, if you'd like to take that one directly in the chat. But I think there are also some overarching questions and it's a very nice note, we were kind of vending around this topic of engagement uh, in your presentation, Alicia. And I think that that's another question that comes through in the chat um, for uh, Estonia, but I think it's a good question for everyone, this, this idea of engagement. And uh, we were asked, for example, um, can you share with us your experience of how older people or vulnerable groups um, have engaged with services? So I think that that's something, um, if Annette, you could address, address that question. And I wanted to actually come back, Belen, to this question of um, engaging different partners and how, how have you engaged different partners to work on these activities together? Because I really think that there's a valuable learning in that for other countries or other groups that would want to, um, to also work together in a multi-sectoral way. So I will stop talking now and give the floor perhaps first to Annette and then to Belen and Alicia, if you'd like to add any final remarks uh, after that. And I'm conscious we're very short on time. Officially our session ends in one minute. So maybe we can rob just two or three minutes from the next session, but not more. So, okay, thank you. All right, I will take it over here and try to be very fast. Uh, it works twice in Ersa uh, with uh, Finland, so that we can, uh, I can also travel to Finland and they can come also here. It doesn't work uh, like that I can't travel with my Estonian identity card to Portugal and get my prescriptions there because their internal system is not ready for that. So obviously, if we have this kind of cross-border collaborations, that needs to be ready. I just yesterday had this conversation with one of our delegations that was in person here. 
and, and they were asking also like, how did you choose the countries that you can have this cross-border uh, projects together? And obviously this is based on how uh, far, um, I mean, with their systems and developments, uh, the other countries, because obviously if, uh, if most of the stuff even internally is not happening yet, then how can we even collaborate on a cross-border level? Um, so, so yeah, uh, right now we also are about to start this collaboration with Iceland, uh, because they are also doing pretty fantastic, and I do hope also with Sweden uh, sometime soon. Uh, but but uh, but I would I would also just add it uh, with how do we get the elderly people engaged, and uh, and obviously this has been the main goal for us since very early days already, not to leave anybody behind, and that's why I've been we've been very actively providing also uh, a proper education for the elderly. And, and if you think about the elderly, uh, the biggest engagement for them with the medical sector is usually their prescriptions and medicals, because this is what they buy the most. Um, the good thing, and if you put yourself into the shoes of being a, an elderly person, um, we can even, um, again, renew our prescriptions over the phone. So this elderly person, probably everybody almost have phones so that they can just call their doctor and ask their doctor to renew the prescription without them having to show up at their doctor. And, and, and besides this, they don't even need to have this high literacy because the only thing that they need to do is just walk to the pharmacy, hand over their identity card, and they will be uh, helped there. So, so if, if, you, if it, I, I mean, it can sound like a science fiction that elderly people must be all the time on computers and knowing how to do everything. Not really. I mean, if, if you even don't have this literacy, you can also be still engaged by, by just using the card itself. And, and also I know a lot of uh, elderly people who might not have a computer and then they're, um, they can also choose their representative so that their um, kids, their daughter or a son can also be a representative on a medical platform and help them with, with the summaries or if there is any kind of analysis that uh, need to be checked there or anything like this. So, so it, again, it might sound more difficult, but actually it's very simple for the users. And this has been the goal for us since very early days. Provide a location, talk about how things work, how they have stored, and also provide as much as transparency. And, and then people will use, will trust, and will really enjoy uh, this kind of customer experience by using the um, online medical services. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and I, yes, I'm afraid we're we're really running short on time. Perhaps what I could propose the the chat has really um, opened up. There are a lot of questions coming in now. Could maybe Belen and Alicia and Annette, maybe you would be able to send some responses just through the through the chat because I think there are some really good questions coming. And um, I'm I'm so sorry that we don't have more time. Um, it's uh, thank you really uh, so much to everyone in session one. We appreciate it so much. So um, I'm now very pleased to hand the floor to uh, my colleague um, Sumina, Dr. Sumina Azam. Uh, who's uh, an executive board member of EuroHealthNet and also works for Public Health Wales. Um, so Sumina will be leading us through yes. session two. Thank you so much, Sumina. The floor is yours. Thank you, Alison, and good morning all. Um, so in our second session, we have three excellent speakers who will explore further the latest research on the importance of digital inclusion through the development of digital skills, digital health literacy, the role of the healthcare workforce, and the importance of working with our communities. So we've heard already how there is a direct link between the levels of digital health literacy and socioeconomic disparities. We've also heard that, there are, that those who need digital health technologies are the most, the most are the least likely to use them. So this is very much the inverse care law, which was spoken about by Alicia. So this means that there is a risk that the increasing uptake of in a, innovative digital health technologies leave some people behind. This is a real concern to us who are working to reduce health, health inequalities. And through this session, we are considering the implications of rapid digitalization of health and social services, and indeed how we can ensure that all users can access and benefit from services. So we have three speakers lined up. First of all, we have Professor Dr. Orkan Orkan, followed by Ms. Katazina Patak Rufkens and Mr. Lars Munter. So, may I introduce you to Professor Dr. Orkan Orkan? He's a researcher at the Department of Sport and Health Sciences, Health Literacy, Technical University, Maastricht, Munich. 
Um, so Dr. Orkan, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Sumina. Can you see my screen now? Yes, yes we, we can. can. Thank you. Amazing. So thanks for having me. I'm Orkan Okan from Germany Technical University of Munich. And today I want to talk a bit about digital health literacy, show some evidence and also implications for early promotion. We already heard about by the uh, speakers in the other session, how important uh, skills and literacies are. And health literacy is a way to approach um, skills and um, uh, literacy for health. It basically describes uh, the competence to access, understand, appraise, and apply health information, which in particular today's world is relevant due to migration to the digital realm, which is why we call it then digital health literacy, but also in context of health promotion 4.0, where we face digital transformation of society. And in no time, uh, like in uh, COVID, we experienced the practical relevance um, of health literacy and digital health literacy and embedded in these digital developments. For example, uh, digital health literacy is important uh, during the pandemic for people to acquire and use knowledge about coronavirus yeah, so that they can understand and apply um, behavioral recommendations made by uh, governments and authorities, such as taking physical distancing, wearing a face mask, or adhering to hygiene measures. But digital health literacy is also important uh, to equip people and let them participate in any form of communication and decision making can be risk communication can be health communication but can also be any other form of communication and also they are equipped with the skills necessary to access and critically think about health information which in particular is important these days when we look at this bullet point here so there are a lot of dis and misinformation out there since the COVID pandemic and through health literacy, people can fact check them and distinguish good from bad information. But on top of all of that comes the infodemic, the information epidemic, which comes along with digital health information, online health information being available in masses, good information, trustworthy information, but also not so accurate, wrong, false information, such as fake news, etc. So in the context of this, in uh, Germany, when the pandemic started, um, with a group of researchers, which you can see here below at the bottom of my slide, we have developed the HLS COVID-19 project, which is a longitudinal uh, health literacy assessment project in the German population aged 16 years and plus. And uh, what you see here are the three different measurement points where we have assessed chronospecific health literacy. And I want to make it very brief because I have a couple of uh, slides from different projects. What you can see here basically is that during our first measurement point in the uh, early months of the pandemic, 50%, um, approximately 50% of the population in Germany had low health literacy, while in the course of the pandemic, you can see that the amount of people with high health literacy has increased, whereas the amount of people with lower corona-specific health literacy has decreased, which you can see here. But we can also see um, a turnaround. Um, it is getting worse after a couple of months. And we associate this that uh, in the course of the pandemic, health information uh, um, and health communication was uh, improved, health information uh, got better and better, and so it was more easier for people to inform themselves. But we can also see that there is a social gradient in uh, low corona-specific health literacy with education and income being uh, predictors. However, we find no differences for other social demographic variables. And interestingly, and a theme that we will see in many of my slides, uh, the most challenging tasks were evaluating uh, online media information in relation to COVID, so critical health literacy, and being able to use them. 
And we already did a fourth uh, measurement and the fifth one is ongoing. So this is not only a German study, but this is an international study. We are conducting it in uh, Austria and uh, Switzerland as well. Another very uh, interesting international European study is the European Health Literacy Survey. And the slides that you see here have been provided to me by Professor uh, Dr. Jürgen Pelikan on behalf of HLS19 Consortium, which is a WHO action network on measuring population and organizational health literacy. And you see two slides. On the left-hand side, you see the average percent uh, responses on digital health literacy for different European countries. And on my right-hand side, you see the items uh, that we use to measure digital health literacy and um, how um, the percentages of uh, an item was rated very difficult or rather very easy. And what you can see here is that um, Although for all of these countries, uh, digital health literacy levels were high. So people uh, reported to have uh, not so many difficulties, found it easy or very easy to deal with um, online health information. You can see some countries and in particular Germany, which I will be going into detail on my next slide, uh, that more than half of the population had difficulties with their digital health literacy. And you can see there uh, a different pattern across the country. Some countries uh, do rather good. For example, uh, we have here Norway, uh, Portugal, Hungary, Austria, and other countries yeah, such as Germany, they do not so good. And what you, I, I told you in the earlier slides that uh, there is a repeating, a recurring theme, and this is that people have problems with their digital health literacy in relation to critical evaluation. And the same case you can see here, and especially again with Germany, where a significant uh, amount of the uh, population reported to have most problems with judging information um, and having problems with critical health literacy. And when we look in particular on the German results, uh, we can see also that there is again a social gradient. Yes, you see for education, for social status, uh, uh, age is an important factor, having a chronic condition is a factor, migration background is a factor, uh, and gender not so much. In another study that we did on uh, digital health literacy in university students as part of the COVID health literacy network, uh, we can see um, that the digital health literacy level of university students uh, is much better than of the general population. But again, you can see that uh, the evaluating the reliability, so the critical digital health literacy is the most challenging tasks even for university students. And um, these are some results on adolescents and children's health literacy on the left-hand side from the HBSC study, on the right-hand side from German studies. And uh, I will skip the European studies and uh, focus on the German studies because I'm already running out of time. You can see that in comparison, the uh, younger children report um, or assess their health literacy much higher than the older adolescents, whereas 80 and 90% of younger age groups report to have high health literacy. Uh, in grade seven and nine, adolescents report to have a lot of dif uh, difficulties with different tasks, tasks related to health information. And of course, this uh, could be maybe younger children overestimate their own competencies in relation to health literacy and underestimates the task at hand. So here, these are the results in detail of the uh, study in uh, young children in primary schools. I will skip that, having, having the time in mind. And this is, uh, these are the results for uh, digital health literacy in the adolescents, the results that I've shown on the other slide. So uh, these results indicate that early promotion of health literacy is very important because addressing health literacy early has more effects than addressing it late. We have uh, developed a couple of reports for several organizations on how to address health literacy in schools, and we found that there are certain challenges and barriers. First, health literacy is new to schools. There is no curriculum, almost no policies. 
Many countries do not use school education, which, which serve the purpose to address health literacy. Teachers are not being trained in health literacy. The school curriculum is overcrowded. It's very difficult to import new topics. So there is almost no time to do that. But there are certain ways how we can address health literacy. In Germany, for example, there is the digital literacy curriculum in place for a couple of years. And you can see here the curriculum and its dimensions that it has close relations to health literacy. For example, this area is the health literacy core. These areas address communicative and critical health literacy, and these address overall comprehensive um, extended health literacy dealing with uh, media use and IT use. And we have used that model and developed an intervention based on this digital literacy curriculum, our toolbox for health literacy, and uh, by using a curriculum that is mandatory and that is already in place in Germany, we have been able to embed health literacy in an existing curriculum, use it, and we also avoid um, further overcrowding the curriculum. So teachers are very happy. This allows us to address health literacy as early as in grade one. And the good thing is that uh, it's not only the school curriculum, but this, this school curriculum comes along with the teacher curriculum at uh, university training, education, and further education of teachers. So also teachers are being trained in that uh, curriculum. And we thought that having keeping in mind that many countries, that the same applies for many countries, that the curriculum is overcrowded and it's difficult to get health literacies in there. This could be a blueprint how other countries could do it as well. Seek Go into the curriculum, check if there are any topics that are associated to health literacy, similar to health literacy, and use them to address health literacy. Uh, last but not least, this is my last slide. There is another intervention in Germany called Nebulus. It's a digital app, also browser web, uh, browser-based web application, and this promotes digital health literacy and navigational uh, health literacy using entertainment education and game elements. So uh, the children use a smartphone, they, they become a task. And in order to uh, solve the task, they have to physically move around the city, talk to health professionals, receive health informations. And by the end, when they uh, uh, complete the game, um, they have uh, gone through several stations and applied different of their health literacy skills. And this is a very interesting, uh, fairly new intervention. And the information uh, can be found on the website and also in the publication. Thank you so much. I've reached the end of my uh, presentation and I hope I have not exceeded my presentation too much. Thank you so much, Professor Orkan. That was incredibly insightful for us all, really interesting to hear and very clear. And it's really impressive the range of work that's underway. So um, we will come back and we will be asking questions and I will ask the audience to start putting your questions in the chat function and we will keep an eye on that. Um, and perhaps in the intervening time, if you could sort of think about, you know, perhaps, you know, what you would say to policymakers or to us practitioners out there, how we can use your learning. So I think there's some really helpful insights in there that would be really helpful. So I will move on and introduce our second speaker. Um, our second speaker is Ms. Katarzyna Patak-Pukens, who's a policy officer, uh, performance of national health systems, DG Sante at the European Commission. So uh, Katarzyna, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sumina, for your nice welcome. And thank you for inviting the European Commission to this uh, very interesting seminar. I hope you can see my slides. Yeah, probably. Yes, we uh, so can. It's, a, it's a pleasure to talk you through um, our actions at our level. What do we do to address uh, the problems of um, digital skills related to digital skills uh, in healthcare systems uh, in, in the society? So obviously, this is one of the priority areas in the current Commission's work program to improve uh, the skills um, of the population. It made it really high uh, at the policy level to the European Pillar of Social Rights Action Plan, which was announced this year, and which is act which reaffirmed the commitment to improve um, the skills of the population, and actually along the broader target for improving the skills. Uh, there is a sub-target related to digital skills themselves. 
So we aim at, in, at making sure that at least 80% of the adult population have basic digital skills. And the same target is, uh, uh, is reiterated in another policy um, document, which is the digital compass and the associated um, uh, path to a digital decade, which is um, a kind of the implementation uh, framework for the digital compass. So the digital compass is, is a document which sets um, the policy objective for 2030. And of course, skills are at the core uh, of this um, of the strategy together with the digitalization of uh, public services, including e-health. Uh, we don't hide that we have uh, yeah, a lot of challenges. Uh, a lot has been already said today about it, but uh, certainly what we realize is that uh, healthcare certainly belongs um, to those occupations which are very susceptible to technological uh, skills obsolescence. So there is a need to um, to ensure uh, that there are right investments and policies in place to reinforce uh, the skills of uh, in the healthcare sector. What we've seen, of course, through the pandemic was the search of, of the digital solutions. So a lot of progress has been made. Uh, quick pro progress has been made, but we also see still huge variation across the EU countries in the use of the digital solutions. We recently published the uh, resilience dashboards, which also shows uh, how uh, member states are prepared uh, how resilient they are in the key policy areas. This dashboard includes health, e-health, and as you see, there's still challenges in, in many member states like Bulgaria, Czechia, Greece, Cyprus, uh, Austria, and Romania. What do, we do? what do we do to address these challenges? Uh, we uh, made a commitment uh, uh, to, uh, to join uh, the efforts at the Commission uh, level to uh, build the solid pact for skills, so uh, to participate uh, in the efforts to build the um, wide partnership uh, to uh, ensure that uh, improvement of skills is a priority not only at the European level, but at all the levels, national and subnational level. That's why uh, our objective for, for the next year is to, um, is to implement the so-called Pact for Skills in the health ecosystem, which, is, which will be the part of the broader um, policy agenda in this area. Uh, a kickoff uh, uh, was uh, organized around the uh, round table discussion with uh, at the high political level involving three commissioners, of course, including the health commissioner, uh, where uh, the main challenges and the way ahead was discussed. Um, and uh, we are uh, working uh, on, on the way to uh, make it happen on the ground. Uh, so what is forthcoming next year is indeed uh, um, the establishment of, of the partnership partnership in the health um, ecosystem area. Uh, what would it mean? Well, the main building blocks, blocks uh, would be to, um, to put in place a system for the skills intelligence, so to better understand uh, what are um, what are the main challenges with shortages of skills of healthcare professionals, and on that basis to build a strategy to to improve um, the skills involving um, all the relevant actors. We would also wish to uh, develop some uh, uh, specific uh, deliverables uh, around the strategy, develop uh, specific curricula, uh, training programs, pilot them, and then uh, we would like to mobilize um, efforts across Europe to, um, to support the implementation of specific training programs. Uh, um, on our side, uh, yeah, we see, um, we discuss internally a possibility of uh, providing some support from the EU for health program. So 
uh, the one of the forthcoming uh, actions may be a, indeed a training initiative at our level, which will be concentrated on digital skills of healthcare uh, professionals and people working in healthcare systems. But we would also like to see, of course, national authorities to join us and use the available European funds uh, to, to support skills um, in this area. Um, we also... Yes, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Uh, it seems that uh, participants are seeing uh, gray boxes at the top and on the right oh. side of the slides uh, yes. that are blocking a bit of the text. So I'm really sorry. I don't know what how to solve. No, no problem. Um, I'm really yeah. sorry about it. Yeah. There's an option to optimize for showing video, and if you yeah. unclick that, that will get rid of the. But I'm not certain where to see that option on your end. Yeah, I'm trying to figure it out. Optimize for video clip. Is that the one? That's right. Try you should uncheck that or turn it off. Okay. Yep. I did. That's it. I Sorry about it. Uh, and one of the initiatives which uh, we are kicking off uh, next year, which will also make probably a very important contribution uh, to build a solid strategy for the skills improvement of healthcare is the joint uh, new joint action, uh, which would aim at uh, improving the forecasting capacities for, for skills uh, and professions. Uh, in the healthcare system. So um, this is something which is coming next year. We are working hard to, with uh, interested member states to put it um, in place early, uh, early next year. Now I cannot unfortunately shift my slides. Uh, ah, yeah, okay. Um, we also uh, make sure that um, these messages are heard through the uh, macroeconomic policy governance process, which is, uh, of course, uh, the European semester. And as you see, uh, uh, the last uh, uh, country specific recommendations, which were issued in 2020, highlighted very much both uh, um, challenges related to uh, e health uh, in many member states, but also challenges related to shortages of, uh, of healthcare professionals and distribution of healthcare professionals in, in many, in all the member states, actually. And um, uh, uh, when we think of, um, of the role of the European semester and mobilizing the uh, European funds, uh, especially cohesion funds, when we look at the uh, annex to 2090 country uh, reports, which is still valid for the ongoing negotiations um, of, uh, of the operational programs with the member state skills of healthcare professionals are actually highlighted as a challenge in, in many uh, member states. We've been also very busy recently with another uh, financial instrument, a Recovery and Resilience Fund, which is a centerpiece of the uh, next generation EU recovery instrument. So uh, the implementation is based on the proposals from, from member states. And actually what uh, um, the regulation is set as a tar has set as a target is to use at least 20% of the budget to the digital transition. So of course, healthcare is, is, is part of it. And I just wanted to mention some of the examples of, uh, of the reforms and investments which are related to e-health and include uh, training uh, components. So we see them in many member states and they cover um, many issues. They cover um, uh, the, the measures to increase the take up of digital solutions overall, like for example, um, in Belgium or in France, they can also cover very specific um, projects related to upskilling, reskilling, but also uptake of digital solutions in hospitals, like in Germany or in Portugal. They also cover a broader aspects of, um, of the education system for healthcare professionals and um, that you may see in, uh, in Spain, in Latvia or, or in Czechia. Uh, some of the um, some of the national uh, some of the uh, recovery programs also cover very specific uh, solutions and, and specialized uh, 
uh, care, for example, in Croatia, um, there is an ambition to uh, step up the solutions in, the, in cardiology, uh, or in the Cyprus, there is a, a, a project related to putting in place the influenza sentinel surveillance module and all these uh, actually uh, measures uh, contain that uh, related uh, training uh, measures. Another instrument which can support uh, uh, these efforts is a, um, a flagship initiative uh, from our colleagues um, in, in the DG reform. Uh, which actually uh, would allow member states to um, get some support to develop and implement uh, ref reforms related to the digital transformation of um, healthcare systems, mainly through uh, roadmaps to, to improve uh, the digital skills. Um, another uh, uh, another uh, opportunity to explore is um, is a call which was la launched under the Horizon Europe and uh, that call uh, addresses more specifically the health literacy of the population of, of patients. So that should, uh, the call was closed already in September but projects which will be selected should actually provide uh, um, very broad support to uh, patients to allow them to navigate in the healthcare systems in the in, interact better with uh, healthcare professionals and benefit actually from uh, from the digital opportunities. Uh, what has uh, what is also uh, coming up is. Um, is a call uh, which was already launched uh, under the Digital Europe program and which is also which will also aim at improve the digital skills um, uh, in healthcare. Uh, so as you see, uh, three calls which which were launched uh, have the ambition to to put in place to put in place new uh, curricula for advanced digital skills uh, in, in healthcare, new master's, pro master's programs, but also to um, make a sol solid analysis of, of needs in, in this area and to prepare actions for data space uh, for skills. So that's it briefly uh, from me. It was a pleasure to, to present these actions and I'm happy to address any questions which you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Katarzyna. That was so interesting. And there's an awful lot for all of us to think about. I think colleagues um, who've joined us will be really interested in all the initiatives, the calls that are underway, and, and to understand what the opportunities are going forward. So thank you so much. You. Um, so I will now move on to our final speaker for today, um, who is Mr. Lars Munter, who's the head of International Projects Unit, uh, Danish Committee for Health Education. So, Mr. Munter, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, and um, sorry for joining a little later, but um, it's uh, better late than never, as you know. Um, I've been asked uh, specifically to focus a little bit on um, the importance of, of um, using citizens' community involvement and cross-sectoral uh, collaboration uh, to develop our digital um devices and, and uh, services um in the future um and um i would point to three things about the whys uh, and the one uh the first one is the purpose of it um really important to be uh, that the, what we develop is actually fit for purpose uh, and what better is actually to to uh, to involve the end users uh, in understanding what they actually need and what's the important to them. A fitness for purpose, um, whether you think of it in terms of ethics uh, that uh, you should actually do what people would like, or whether you think of it in terms of, of, um, of having um, less waste. Um, I mean, when we deliver digital services that people don't need, they tend to not be used very much. And we have scarce resources, um, both from a healthcare professional side, but also from a digital developer side. We need to actually focus what we do uh, to actually be fit for purpose. And the second one is, of course, that it creates trust. Co-creation is the way to go to build trust. Uh, if you have um, people that are using these digital services on board as soon as possible, um, 
it is a better way of actually building some trusted services. You know what they're going to do. You know why they're built the way they, they are, they're being built. Uh, and you know, actually, this, the mindset behind. Um, 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 I can see there's some comment as to slides. Well, sorry, but there isn't any slides for this particular segment. I'm sorry. Um, this is um, tr the tra traditional way of actually having a human being um, instead. Um, but to the, my third point um, about this is, of, of course, also uh, in terms of, of quality. Um, I would strongly argue that um, thinking uh, of digital development uh, cross sectors Cross, uh, and in an interdisciplinary way actually ensures better quality. What we've seen uh, maybe uh, in the early stages of, of building digital devices it, that were, they were technically very, uh, well, <laughs> the early days of digital devices, maybe the technicalities thinking um, were, were not that good uh, compared to what we can do in 2021. But anyway, from a technical perspective, they might have worked as well as they could. Um, they were perhaps lacking on the anthropological side, um, the side of actually getting people to uh, appreciate uh, data visualizations or, or actually amending the, uh, understanding the user interface. Uh, we've been much better at that over time. But three elements about, about the why, the purpose, the trust, and the quality. Um, and some good practices then that I would then point to um, one of them I actually mentioned perhaps before, to involve people as early as possible. Um, it's, it's often that we get an idea about having a project that we build a purpose and we then try to, um, to in ask some people whether they'd like uh, to be involved in our project. Um, but in a way that actually, that's actually, um, uh, a, a, if we can move um, that perspective about it would be really good because we need to involve people as early as possible. We need maybe to get some of these people, these citizens, these patients, to be the initiators of our research projects, to be the initiators of our digital services, if at all possible. The second advice that I would point to is to be transparent as, as much as possible. Um, and of course, it is really helpful if you want to be transparent, to have people on board as early as possible. And the last one, uh, as to good advice, is to be patient. Um, it, often we ask the people to be patient, and maybe we should uh, instead have our services to be more patient. It takes time to get people to uh, adopt new habits, to adopt new um, well, services and so on. It takes a, a lot of time, actually, to understand new systems. Um, even if you have a high, um, well, digital literacy, even if you have a high health literacy, understanding uh, new ways of doing stuff is actually much harder than we um, sometimes give credit for. Um, and therefore, being patient is one that we need to uh, think about. We want, of course, in a digital world to uh, be able to do all that we can think technically would be possible. But we have to be mindful that uh, actually adopting them can take uh, a lot more time than we normally uh, or sometimes actually give credit for. Um, and then um, about how we actually at present evaluate what we do. Well, I think that we evaluate poorly, sadly. Um, we uh, tend uh, to uh, shower people in a lot of different uh, opportunities. And we uh, tend then to see that some of them that they are actually using a lot must be a good option. Uh, some of them that they're not using as much must be um, not as good. Um, but going uh, into a lot of other uh, elements than the digital sphere, we would use a lot more anthropological science, sociological science, um, to actually understand better why something works and why not. Um, we would do that normally in social services and so on, and rightly so. Um, even though we're using digital devices that are, um, well, inherently technical in nature, um, the end users are people, humans. 
the developers are humans, the designers are human, and, and uh, therefore the, this is uh, just by proxy another type of human interaction that we need to understand much better, even in 2021. So let's use some of our good old um, humanistic uh, knowledge or uh, research processes to understand better what's actually going on. Um, and some enabling conditions that I uh, am, would, would point to. Um, maybe we are not currently in the wild west of, uh, of uh, digital development, but we are certainly not uh, in um, a modern world when it comes to the digital devices. The, the devices themselves might be uh, fairly advanced, but the, the frameworks and the systems, the ecosystems around them are not necessarily very advanced. Let's ensure some better standards for co-creation and co-development. Let's actually make sure that we have some standardized processes for asking people what they wanted, uh, what they felt, what they needed, and so on. We have some fairly good uh, standards uh, of how to integrate users and to document what we did when we uh, talk about uh, creating pharmaceuticals. Let's use some of those processes for our digital services too. And quality standards. Um, we have gotten some ground, especially the work that ORC is doing in the UK is actually quite good. Um, but we need to move uh, forward in other sectors or other, other regions to do that. I'm, I'm hoping that we have gained some ground in the Nordics with the Nordic Interoperability Project, but um, it's early days yet, uh, and uh, we should move forward on that. And then the last one, um, to make sure that we give some more breathing room to our healthcare professionals. Um, we want we, I'm not exactly sure uh, the we here, who the we is, but the people need, um, we want people to use our digital services. The people would like to use the digital services, but they also would like some more guidance when they turn to the healthcare professional to, to know more about. Can you please tell me how to use this? What does it mean when it does so and so? How do you, would you interpret uh, the data that this device generates? And we need to give our healthcare professionals some more breathing room in, in, for them to also gain some better digital skills um, to actually also be better at helping the citizens uh, navigate a digital world. So without any slides, that would be my presentation. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Winter, that was incredibly helpful. And I've got to say, a lot of what you said really struck. So you talked about patients evaluating better um, and th the importance of giving people breathing room. And in a time of COVID where everything has been so fast, you know, I, I think many of us feel like there hasn't been any breathing room. So I think what you've said would really have struck home with, with a lot of people on the call. So thank you so much. So um, I'm, I'm going to now um, ask if our three speakers can be spotlighted, because um, we now have an opportunity for our audience to ask some questions. Um, we've had lots of questions already, but please do ask more questions in the chat function. Um, so what I'll do is I will ask a few of the questions, because we do have about 10 minutes, so we can ask perhaps one question per speaker, um, and hopefully we might have some time for, you know, toing and froing and, you know, discussion too. So um, first of all, there was a question quite early on at Professor Ogkan. Um, so this was about um, how we engage um, uh, how the engagement with teachers and the curriculum and what lessons there are for other countries in how you've done this. So um, Ogkan, would you be able to um, help with responding to this? Yes, of course. Thank you so much. I like that question. Um, what I meant was that um, in Germany, there is no health education. So there are many school subjects, but there is no mandatory health education. And therefore, uh, health education is the natural subject which would be used to promote health literacy. <clears throat> but there is no such topic. So um, it is very difficult to get new topics, especially health topics, into schools. Makes it hardly impossible to do that. 
And therefore, what one can do if facing the same challenges and problems in their country and education system is that one could check the curriculum. Are there subjects, topics, or concepts of available existing in the curriculum that are similar to health literacy and as such digital literacy and media literacy in Germany sometimes used interchangeably are very similar as shown in the um, model, the competence model. And uh, these competence models often are not topic or subject related. So, so you can use any topic to teach these competencies. And in the case of the German curriculum on digital and media literacy, if you use health as a topic, what you would get would be health literacy. And so this is what I meant as a blueprint for other countries. Check the curriculum. Are there topics that are similar to the concept of health literacy? And can health literacy be addressed by using them as surrogates? And ideally, such topics are also part of the mandatory teacher training curriculum, which would mean that you would not only um, sustain a situation where you can address this in the classroom, but you would also address this uh, in teacher training and equip them with the skills that they later need to address the topic in schools. Uh, we have writ written about it in our WHO report on health literacy in schools. That was on one of the slides, but also in our fact sheets uh, for schools for health in Europe. And you can also contact me uh, to further discuss this. Thank you so much for your really clear answer. Um, I next would like to pose a question to Katarzyna. So we had a question here about how do we integrate digital security in developing health literacy interventions? So I think there'll be a lot of us um, who have a little bit of suspicion about the security of information. So would you, would you be able to help respond to this? Yes, thank you very much. Yes, this uh, important issue is, of course, part of the considerations um, under the um, current work, which is led by, by my colleagues working on the digital side, so the uh, European health data space. Yes, so um, this is, of course, at the core uh, of the discussed uh, uh, proposal. Uh, we also give uh, uh, opportunities to member states to deal uh, with this challenge um, uh, from their national perspectives, because uh, challenges yeah, are to some extent common, of course, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, the um, framework, the legis legislative framework, uh, but also um, infrastructural solutions uh, can vary. Uh, quite a lot. And we were very happy to see that in the um, um, recovery programs and resilience programs, there were indeed some proposals which uh, 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 included this important issue, just uh, giving you an example, which was presented on my slide, the example of uh, investments uh, proposed by Belgium uh, in the recovery plan, and it indeed takes into account um, this important issue of the secure uh, health systems um, and so on. So uh, there are opportunities uh, indeed uh, for, for member states to, um, to tackle them and yeah we hope to uh, hope to uh, um, see them yeah in the implementation of the recovery plans but also we hope that uh, uh, future investment are the, the, the cohesion package uh, will also take it into account because we imagine that uh, digitalization will remain a very important uh, priority area of, um, of investments under the cohesion package. So this is another opportunity actually to um, combine both uh, hard investment, but also soft investments. Yeah, so this investments in skills uh, to ensure, ensure that yes, yeah, security is um, tackled to the right degree and extent. Thank you. I hope it, uh, it answers. Question. Thank you. That's very, very helpful. Um, I am conscious that time is running away, but I would like to briefly ask one more question um, to Lars. And uh, this was about, um, do, do you have an advocacy program in order to achieve your goals? Because what came across very strongly was, was the strength of feeling. Um, an advocacy. Well, at, at least um, <clears throat> what we're also doing is, and, and, um, uh, I was lucky enough to debate this with Orkin the other day. 
um, is also um, understanding that digital literacy it does not necessarily start um, with turning on uh, the electricity. Um, I mean, um, we need to consider how we can teach digital literacy, maybe by using other media to become um, to to begin with. Uh, throwing people into the deep end is not the way to to learn people how to swim. Uh, even though I would admit that it's uh, best to actually swim with uh, water, uh, it's it's really hard to do without. But um, it is very very um, important that we recognise that we need to build uh, a better understanding of this by using perhaps other media too, uh, and starting earlier, but not necessarily, but just handing out more well iPads uh, for for a younger and younger generation understanding both the ethics about it, the usability about it, and so on, is something that must be more social too, um, that we do as part maybe in families, but also in the educational system, where we build digital literacy before we actually turn on the electricity and start, um, well, using the digital devices. So the advocacy, well, we've been doing uh, a lot of work actually on mentalization um, in schools, where we are talking about how to build uh, the capacity to understand mental challenges before you start uh, developing problems, for instance, with online bullying or otherwise uh, problems. So um, we must recognize that these problems will uh, appear in the future, um, but we need to also then start to um, uh, build people's um, well muscles before they need they need to use them. Um, so that would be one of our approaches. We are doing that both um, in uh, vocational schools. We're doing that uh, in, in adolescence, and we're trying to see how we can do that more uh, with uh, even younger children, um, to, so that they can gain digital literacy, but not by throwing in the deep end and having them to see how they survive the labyrinth themselves. Thank you. Thank you so much. And can I take this opportunity to thank all our three speakers for their wonderful presentations and also for answering some of the questions. There are more questions in the chat. So if our speakers are able to, we would very much appreciate if you could review those and perhaps answer those. Answer those. That'd be lovely. So um, we are now at 10.26 um, and we do have a very brief break until 11, um, 11.26. Sorry, I'm thinking of UK time. We're 11.26, we have a break until 11.35. Um, after the break, we will have uh, Ms. Lorna Renwick join us. Lorna is a EuroHealthNet Executive Board Member and the Organisational Lead for Health Equity at Public Health Scotland. And she will be moderating session three. So um, please all do take a comfort break and rejoin us at 11.35. Thank you so much.
Hello there, everyone. Welcome. Uh, we're now on our third session. It's good to see everyone. Um, hopefully you've had a good rest and managed to stretch your legs. Um, it's always a challenge when we're, we're on our online platforms and at desks all the time. So for the third session, we're going to have a panel debate and a Q&A um, on the role of modern media and marketing approaches in digital health literacy. So it's, we've heard this morning about how it's become increasingly common for us all to look for information. That's including health information and that's online and via social networking sources. And while this offers us a great opportunity to mainstream discussions about health promotion and disease prevention for the general population, as we've heard this morning, it does risk widening health inequalities as not everyone has the same access and uh, digital health literacy skills and resilience, and particularly resilience against misinformation and fake news. So that raises questions on how to effectively use social marketing strategies to support health promotion and improved health literacy and face challenges around misleading commercial practices online, which might be combated through um, effective use of social marketing strategies. So, Session three, this session, um, aims to explore the role of modern media and marketing approaches in digital health literacy and um, share some best practice from the field. So we have four speakers today. Our first is Professor Jill Rowland from um, Newcastle University. And so Jill will go first and then we'll have some questions and then we'll move on to three speakers from our EuroHealthNet thematic working group or twig on social marketing to tackle addictions. So first of all, if I could pass to you, um, Jill, I can see your picture there now. That's great because you hadn't popped up on my screen. I was getting a bit worried. Um, so the floor is yours. Welcome. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. So I'm just going to share my slides. Okay, can everybody see that? Is that okay? Yeah? Okay. Yes. yes. So, um, so hello everybody, and I'm I'm just um delighted to be here. Uh so I was really interested to be asked to give this uh, particular uh talk. And actually, I think um this is going to raise more questions than it answers, and I'd be very interested to hear people's thoughts in the discussion. So um, I'm going to, uh, there's a lot in this that has come up in, in previous presentations, so I'm not going to, to dwell on stuff that's come up elsewhere, but I am just going to uh, put some definitions um, down here, some thoughts about digital skills and health. One of my questions was to think about why we should focus health literacy efforts on people uh, at the two ends of the life course, just to reflect a bit on social patterning skills and give a, what I think is a very good example of the use of modern media for uh, disease prevention. Um, so there are multiple definitions of health literacy. We've heard a couple of them, but at its core, health literacy is all about the capacities of individuals, families and communities to get hold of, understand, appraise and apply information for health. And then digital health literacy, um, as we've heard, is simply moving those capacities into the digital field. We've heard a lot about the infodemic. I'm also a general practitioner, so this is something I'm coming up against every day. Uh, the Internet is obviously a fantastic force for good. It's also potentially a fantastic source for real harm because of the quantity of um, invalid and dangerous information and the, um, the way in which uh, the internet and social media can amplify that. So uh, health literacy can be seen as a balance between these capacities and skills in people and communities and the demands and complexities of the system. So we can focus on either or both of those areas in terms of increasing digital health literacy. So we know that the internet uh, is a huge force for good in terms of health. So uh, these data are from the uh, 2014 European Citizens Digital Health Literacy Survey. So over half of people surveyed 
used um, the internet to get information to promote their health or to prevent illness. Over half used it to find information about illness and nearly a quarter for information about a medical treatment and procedure. Um, to reflect back on this, this has been mentioned by other speakers, but I do think it's important. So um, this is an upside down slide. It shows the proportion of the population at different ages who have never used the internet. So we can see that younger people have very high use of the internet. Older people have much lower use, but the use of the internet is increasing with time. So in the second measurement um, uh, time of 2015, only a third of people in the over 65 group had never used the internet. So things are changing and we need to support the ongoing uh, delivery of that change. Uh, this is also very important. This has been brought up by other speakers. There's um, social inequalities. So people without formal qualifications in lower socioeconomic groups with low income are far less likely to have access to the internet and skills to use it. So we have to remember that uh, all the time. And therefore, uh, digital health literacy has the capacity to um, increase health inequalities if we're not careful. So one of my questions was as to why we should focus on younger people and older people. And in particular, why focus on younger people if they're using the internet all the time anyway? I would focus, um, I would ask people who are interested in this area to look at this really excellent uh, report, which this slide is, is uh, derived from. As a GP, I think it's so important to focus on younger people because this is the age where people make decisions about health behaviours that are set for life. So if we can set good habits at a young age, that is so helpful. And we know there's high internet use. Also, I was really surprised at the young age of people starting to use the internet. So we can start to engage with people at a very young age, but don't forget the inequalities in digital access. That is also true for younger people. We've talked about the challenge of the infodemic, uh, but what was very encouraging was the proportion of children in this survey who were did recognize that and worried about how to find the correct information online. And they were using recognized authorities such as the NHS uh, to guide the selection of safe and appropriate tools. So if you think back to that slide about the balance, this is a way in which the system can really help uh, to promote the use of safe tools. Again, as a GP, one of the things that really concerns me are the images of perfect bodies on social media. And I think there's a lot to be done there to counteract the anxiety and disorders that that can promote. So for those of us who are fans of Harry Potter, um, we can call older people um, digital muggles, and I can include myself uh, in that group now. Um, uh, and for those of us who, who aren't Harry Potter fans, this is really saying that older people are often excluded from the magic of the internet. Um, but not only do they have lower access and use, they have a greater need for it because of the increasing prevalence of long-term health conditions with age. And we also know that lower health literacy there's a double whammy here. It both increases the risk of long-term health conditions and it's associated with lower digital skills. So this is just to emphasize the issue of age and long-term chronic health conditions. Also, of course, people are much more likely to have multiple chronic health conditions. Um, so they are people who really need to be able to get good information fast, and the internet is perfect for that. So uh, this is a, a study that I did on general health literacy with Sarah Gibney and, and colleagues from Ireland looking at Irish health literacy data. And we found, as you'd expect, that the proportion of the population with a long-term health condition was very different in the different socioeconomic groups. 
But what was of real interest to us is that it's only in that lowest group that the risk of having a long-term health condition was statistically significantly associated with also having health, low health literacy. And we have hypothesized from that, that focusing resources on that lowest socioeconomic group, building skills in that group has the capacity to reduce health inequalities. And I would also posit that that is probably true of digital skills. If anybody has a lovely big digital skills uh, data set or can, I'm looking at you, uh, then that might be something we could replicate with this. Here's what I think is a really good example of um, how the modern media can be used to promote health and prevent disease. So this was a, um, a campaign from Public Health England to um, inform people about the importance of fast actions when somebody is presenting with a stroke. I won't go through this in detail, people can have access to this afterwards, but what I'd like to highlight is that for every one pound spent on this campaign, there was a 28 pound benefit in terms of reduction in disability and also in reduction in terms of health and social care spend. Another question I was asked to answer were partnerships between the digital industry and health. And I looked and I couldn't find any. Now, if anybody in the audience knows of stuff, please do share it with us. The fact that I couldn't find anything um, tells me that this is a very fruitful area uh, for future development. I know that there's talk about at the end about putting things together for a call for action and maybe those partnerships and developing it is something we could do. So uh, that's everything from me. I'd be very interested uh, to hear your thoughts and questions. And thank you so much again for uh, inviting me to talk. Thanks so much, Jill. That was really, really insightful and interesting to look at the, the, the health campaigns and how they're for, for social media uh, and the, the cost effectiveness as well. It's really good to see, isn't it? Um, I wondered, um, it really struck me, we're just... Um, We'll get some questions coming in, but I wonder just before we move on to our next speakers, if you could say more, it struck me about the, what was it 45% of children were aware of looking for the wrong, that are finding the correct information. And if there's anything more you want to say on that, because that struck me that they do actually, some of them have an awareness about not looking for the wrong thing. Yeah, and I'd like to link this back to what all can was saying. I mean, of course, the flip side of that is it was only 45% and that means 55% are not aware of it. So I think there's a lot, um, there's a lot there that the education system needs to do. Now, all um, um, uh, education systems now um, are um, teaching IT skills and this needs to be brought in, I would argue, to that. Um, and if there is a health component uh, in teaching into that too. Um, but I was encouraged to see that 45% recognise that at such a young age. And I really think that's something that health services have to step up to. Uh, we have to talk about how um, it, there's brilliant stuff on the internet, there is rubbish stuff on the internet, there is dangerous stuff on the internet. And we need to provide mechanisms for pointing people. How do you tell whether something comes from a good source? Um, um, you know, because some of these, um, you know, very false information, for instance, about vaccines, um, it's very professionally produced. It looks terrific. Um, so how do you tell? So building those critical skills, um, I think, is, is really important from a very young age, but also then um, as a health service and as health practitioners, learning how to point people. Like, for instance, in my clinics, I say, if it's on the NHS website or it's pointed to from the NHS website, then it's good. Otherwise, I wouldn't trust it because... Um, you know, that's the only way I can be sure. So I think there's a lot to be done from both the education system, but also the health system. That's great. Thank you. There was a comment there just around um, the, the link up with the digital industry and maybe quite a lot in the uh, clinical services in VR and computing. And I know with COVID and the recent apps there, there were, but it'd be good to see if we can pick that up at the end as well. 
So thanks so much, Jill, for your input. That was really insightful. Thanks so much for your time. So I'm going to pass on now to our um, uh, our Twig, our European, our, our excuse me, our Euro Health Net thematic uh, members for social marketing to tackle addiction. So I think our first speaker will be, um, I think, is it going to be Sigrid or Jennifer? But I will pass on to them. The floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you so much. Um, it's really interesting to hear all these great presentations today. Uh, my name is Sigrid Trollstra and I work as a scientific advisor on tobacco control at the Trimmels Institute for Mental Health and Addiction in the Netherlands. And today, together with Jennifer Davis, who is a policy officer on the partnerships and advocacy for Santé Publique France, I will tell you about our new EuroHealthNet thematic working group called Social Marketing to Tackle Addictions. Um, we had just had our first meeting last month, and we are very excited to share with you our plans and ambitions for this TWIG. Okay, so um, addictions such as uh, tobacco and alcohol consumption are main risk factors for premature mortality and increased morbidity in developed societies. Um, therefore, they're also shared key targets in national public health strategies in EU countries. The COVID-19 crisis has upset a lot of such strategies by changing and often increasing uh, consumption patterns and thereby often further increasing also the social inequalities. Marketing techniques and tools can be used to craft and disseminate effective social change strategies, but they're often accused of increasing rather than reducing inequalities. Therefore, we need uh, strong and comprehensive strategies. And the aim of our thematic working group is to share and exchange knowledge and best practices regarding these strategies to tackle addictions and substance use. So we have defined social marketing for our purposes as an approach to develop activities aimed at changing or maintaining people's behavior for the benefit of individuals and society as a whole and thereby combining ideas from commercial marketing and the social sciences. Uh, social marketing can be a proven tool for influencing behavior in a sustainable and cost-effective way. And I just want to bring your attention to the part in the definition on society as a whole, uh, because uh, this highlights the need to focus also on people with a lower digital health literacy, who might be less resilient against misinformation and fake news. And by effective use of these strategies, we want to direct people towards the right information. Um, so we'll focus on social marketing strategies and we will also include mass media campaigns in this. Um, and we are mainly focused on tobacco and alcohol use, but also include other types of addictions. Um, so in the light of this, we have uh, brought together nine institutes of public health um, and launched a network of experts uh, with responsibilities and their expertise in the field of addictions and social marketing. And the current member organizations are from Austria, England, Germany, France, Ireland, Italy, the Netherlands, Poland and Wales. So we've brought together quite a, uh, a group. And now I want to give the word to Jennifer Davies. We'll continue our presentation and tell you a bit about our uh, work and our uh, future meetings. Thank you, Sigrid. Um, hello, thanks a lot, Lona. Thanks a lot, Euro Healthnet, for this wonderful opportunity to present our work. Um, so, uh, just a quick word on the agenda of next sessions. Uh, the next next session is uh, um, on Friday, Friday the tenth of December. It will be dedicated to two. Uh, issues uh, within the general frame of social marketing to tackle addictions. Uh, the first issue will be on uh, tobacco prevention campaigns during the COVID pandemic, how countries manage to make to tobacco prevention emerge during the, the pandemic and what uh, devices they launched. And the second issue will be dedicated to cross presentations of national October campaigns. And at the end of the session, will have very practical and operational questions such as um, how can we uh, involve health professionals more to our social marketing devices 
and how to reach more most vulnerable populations. So that will be it for the next session. And then another session held on the 14th of January dedicated to the denormalization strategies of uh, tobacco and uh, alcohol prevention. Uh, of course, digital health will be at the heart of our largest social marketing devices. We will feed the program of next session uh, on Friday, because this is how we work, what uh, Twig members want to see on the agenda, we just add it. So next, please. Yeah, just <laughs> join us. Don't, uh, we'd be delighted uh, to have you on board. The, uh, the Twig is a great opportunity to share and exchange all together on our challenges, on our common issues and our common practices on uh, social marketing and addictions. We're very hope, open to new members, to any suggestions. We're very happy to discover your views, your new devices, and uh, suggest uh, join us either just for one session if you're interested in a particular topic or for as a Twig member. Uh, it's also a great opportunity for you uh, to be um, aware of uh, upcoming events, especially in the perspective of the French presidency. So if you have any question, just send Sigrid and I an email. You have our contact details just below in the slide. Uh, we'll be very delighted to uh, answer all questions and to welcome you on board. So now I'll give the floor to my colleague Justine, uh, also from the uh, French Public Health Agency. Justine? Good morning, everyone. Uh, Lorna, do you, do you share my slides? Or... My colleague Renaud will share your slides. Okay. Perfect. So I'm Justine Avenel. I work, uh, as uh, Jennifer was saying, with her at the French Health uh, Public Agency. Uh, and uh, I'm a project manager for Moi Sans Tabac, which is a French version of Stoptober. And I work also as a social marketing and communication officer on tobacco issues. And today I'm going to present an example of a topic we can tackle during our SOMAT sessions, uh, which is... Uh, on, uh, today is a presentation of how uh, we reach disadvantaged group uh, when we try to promote uh, tobacco cessation. So first of all, on the first slide, next slide, please. Uh, I'd like to share with you a quick glimpse of uh, the French context on uh, smoking. Since we have a high daily smoking prevalence in France, uh, um, among a among the adult population, it's quite a quarter of the, of the people smoking. So it's quite high. And uh, when we watch uh, the socioeconomic situation of the people smoking, we can see that there are uh, many inequalities. If we see the, the charts uh, that are below, we can see on the left uh, that uh, the level of incomes uh, is, uh, has an incidence on prevalence. The pink line uh, represents the prevalence of uh, the people with the lowest income. So we can see that it's higher than the other lines representing uh, prevalence uh, for the people uh, earning uh, the, who are the wealthiest, uh, which is the blue one, and uh, middle incomes, it's the purple line. On the, statue, on the chart on uh, the right, is uh, the, represent the prevalence uh, regarding employment status. So if we look at the pink line, it's the prevalence for unemployed people. Uh, the blue one is for uh, stu students or inactive people. And uh, the purple one uh, is the prevalence uh, on, uh, for working people. Um, so uh, we can uh, make hypotheses why uh, the disadvantaged group uh, smoke more because they struggle more when it comes to stop smoking because they have many other problems in their daily lives and uh, their health is not their first priority. And these inequalities lead us to uh, communicate more fiercely, fiercely sorry, towards this group uh, to help them uh, maybe more effectively uh, to quit smoking. So if we go to the next slide, uh, we see that when uh, we try to promote uh, tobacco cessation uh, to uh, these uh, disadvantaged groups, uh, many questions rises. And the first one is uh, how to reach them through media planning. Indeed, we, we want uh, to broadcast our messages uh, where they are so they can see, uh, they can see uh, these messages. 
So uh, we work with a media agency to select uh, the media uh, we know they consumed, uh, they consume more. Uh, for example, for TV or radio, we will select some channels. Uh, we will uh, select some specific uh, time slots uh, related to program uh, that are uh, that are, we know they consume. So it's quite easy for TV and radio, but uh, for uh, when it comes to digital, it's uh, more complex and we use different uh, targeting tools. So uh, here uh, we try to uh, gather, uh, we gather different uh, family of tools uh, that uh, enable us to target uh, the vulnerable groups. So the first uh, family of, of uh, tools is the contextual tools. So uh, we try to be on the website. Uh, we know they navigate on, for example, in French, we have Le Bon Coin, which is, it, uh, uh, is a French version of uh, the Craigslist. Uh, so it's a platform where we can buy uh, secondhand stuffs, which are uh, way cheaper than uh, the brand new, uh, brand new uh, stuff. Uh, so we know that uh, the people with the lowest income, they go to this kind of website uh, to buy uh, new things. A second family of tool uh, are the behavioral tools. Uh, here, uh, we focus on the keywords, the people uh, type on uh, their keyboards, uh, the keywords they use on search engine. And uh, thanks to those keywords, we know which, what kind of people we're targeting. And for example, when it comes uh, to uh, what we do uh, concerning uh, promoting uh, tobacco cessation, we will target people who uh, are looking for sales, who are looking for special offers, vouchers, or social benefits. It can be either welfare benefits, housing, um, unemployed uh, allowances. And so we have a huge list of uh, keywords that enable us to target uh, the, the disadvantaged uh, groups. And the last family of tools are the data we buy from uh, third parties. Uh, so it means from other actors uh, that we know are uh, people uh, in contact uh, with, uh, not people, but structures or uh, brands in contact uh, with uh, the vulnerable groups. Uh, and for example, uh, what we are going to do for our next uh, campaign in February is that we will uh, we have bought uh, shopper data from uh, low cost retailers thanks to uh, fidelity programs. So when we will target the people who have fidelity programs from their low cost retailer, we know we have a lot of chances uh, to uh, target uh, the people we want to target. So the disadvantaged uh, groups. If we, want, if we go to the next slide, we see another question that came come to us when we uh, we want to promote tobacco cessation for uh, the for this uh, population. It's how uh, we reach them with specific message. So now we know where we should be to uh, to uh, to talk to them, but how should we talk to them? So we focus on two things: style and content. Uh, style is how we are going to formulate our messages uh, so that it can be understandable by everyone. Uh, so our message, all our message in all our campaigns, they are conceived uh, to be accessible by people with no uh, high educational background, uh, who are not good French speakers. So we avoid pen on words, we avoid humor, we avoid sarcasm. Uh, for all our communications and for some specific tools, uh, we really uh, want to dedicate those tools to disadvantaged groups. Uh, so we are going to use really easy to read and understandable language. We are going to accompany everything with a, a very easy illustration to understand. Just below you have, we have a, a video. We, I'm not sure we have the time to see it, but if you have the chance to uh, look at it and if you understand it, Whereas you're not French speaker, so it's a success for us. It means that even people who are not good French speaker, they can understand our messages. And on the second part, we focus on content. So the benefits of a uh, tobacco cessation that we highlight in our communications are uh, benefits that are very relevant to our target. So it can be economic benefits, it can be uh, the freedom benefits, uh, and these help them to be more, uh, more relevant for our targets. And finally, on the next slide, 
the last question that uh, that we 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 have when we want to promote uh, tobacco cessation uh, among those disadvantaged groups are uh, how we can uh, create and invite new devices uh, to uh, really enable them to stop smoking because we know as we said earlier that it's harder for those groups to stop smoking so what can we uh, put in place uh, to uh, to help them what we did uh, this year for uh, the last edition of Moi Sans Tabac was uh, facilitating access to health professionals because we know it's uh, highly effective. Uh, brief advice from a health professional increases the chances of success by 70%. And uh, we carried out last year a survey uh, where in which 65% uh, of the respondents uh, say they would go to a free tobacco consultation if it existed. Because indeed, in, effect, uh, in fact, in France, it doesn't uh, exist as such. Uh, tobacco uh, cessation uh, consultation are not reimbursed by uh, our health insurance system. What is reimbursed is uh, when you go to uh, your GP uh, to ask for help uh, in your in your um, intent of stop stopping uh, quitting tobacco. But many people they don't know that their GP can help them. So we had those two, diff two different problems: a lack of knowledge and lack of accessibility. Uh, so what uh, what does exist in France, if we go to the next slide, is uh, so what is free or reimbursed uh, to stop uh, to, to quit tobacco is our quit line, but it's, it can be uh, quite uh, difficult for uh, people with a uh, low level of French uh, to uh, speak of their problem uh, on the phone. We have the GPs, as uh, we just said, and another thing that we will focus on, which is the exclusive uh, consultations during uh, Moi Sans Tabac. So what is it exactly? Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so these consultations, they only exist, as uh, the name say it, uh, during uh, our, nas our national campaign. Uh, so during uh, the beginning of October to the end of November. It's reimbursed by the health insurance system uh, that can take place in uh, different places. And we have uh, three to 400 places in France, but those places that change everywhere are they're selected uh, by a call for applications each year. And uh, there are no uh, national communication up to this year, of course, because this is what we did, but there were no uh, national uh, communication for the, those uh, consultations. It was uh, left to uh, the structure that um, welcomed these exclusive consultations, but are there tiny structures? Uh, there were no, uh, no uh, resources to promote them. So what we did was we created a national directory uh, with all, uh, not all, but uh, I think uh, half of uh, these places, these structures where you can find these uh, free consultations. Uh, this directory was av available on our website, uh, which uh, has a, a high rate of uh, traffic uh, during Moisson Tabac. So that participant, when they subscribed to uh, the national uh, challenge uh, to quit tobacco, they could find uh, the, um, the directory and find uh, their free consultation. Um, if we go to the next slide, we see that uh, it's when you arrive on uh, the website, when you have uh, subscribed, you have many tools on your your web uh, web page and this is one of the tool it means in uh, in english uh, your appointment with a health professional and the first uh, item is uh, in an exclusive uh, place uh, dedicated to moi sans tabac and if we click on that go to the next slide and uh, we see that the, di the directory uh, looks like that so you enter your address your direction and uh, you get the 10th uh, nearest structure to find this uh, free consultation during Moisson Taba. So uh, this year, we only had uh, half of uh, the structure in our directory because it was quite difficult for us to uh, create the database and, uh, and we were not sure that we would be on time uh, to uh, develop it uh, on the internet. Um, but we aim at enlarging uh, this directory for the next following years so that uh, more people could find, um, find their, their consultation and uh, have a success in their tobacco cessation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Justine. That was really uh, fantastic to hear and really um, 
just just to hear the range of of interventions and and work that you're you're doing there's been quite a lot of action in the chat you may not have noticed things pop up when you were presenting there um, and your colleagues have been fielding them very nicely so thank you to to them um, so there was some questions about um, French public health smoking cessation campaigns working in other French speaking countries so I think that's been picked up um, so there will be people to contact there I'm sure um, and we were potentially going to pick up with a colleague just around links with the digital industry but I believe he's gone um, so just in terms of our panel members, thank you so much. I just wondered if you'd like to just say one last thing um, before we go, just around the, the, the sort of key factor around um, a, 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 the work that you're doing and addressing um, inequalities. Maybe we could come to Jill first. Yeah, so... Um... Yeah, so I, what I'm doing locally um, is actually engaging with our, um, our local authority who provide social services and education services and public health. And we're actually doing work um, that, that fits with the, the, the healthy cities approach, uh, which I think is a really good one. I think engaging with, with, uh, with the healthy cities network is, is really good. And just focusing on you know, how we can build um, skills in disadvantaged groups and and how we can build skills within uh, within communities and and I think you know other um, uh, groups within the uh, healthy cities network are doing very similar things so for instance there's some fast, fantastic work uh, going on in Belfast so um, I think what what comes out of that for me is this this partnerships thing um, and I think we are developing partnerships well within the health and the education and the local authority social services sector I think we've sussed that and we're working very well what I what I would just challenge us all to think about is I know I keep banging on about this but going back to the the, the partnerships issue I think uh, sort of in the health field maybe I mean others can totally disagree with me please feel free but within the health sector and within the within the academic sector well, there's a there's a suspicion I think of industry and that you know people who aren't publicly funded you know maybe their priorities are not the same and I think we've got to get over that um, so you know I'm challenged from having pulled together the presentation and giving it today that one of the things I'm not doing is actually doing that industry engagement and maybe that's something that that I need to focus on uh, more and I would challenge the rest of us to do that too. Thanks so much Jill. Well I think that's a clear call for us to take forward in terms of looking at that partnership not just with other public sectors but the private industry as well um, and something potentially uh, would any of the TWIG members like to pick up just around partnerships and, and just that point around really that very important focus on inequality? Yeah, just maybe a quick word from the French uh, side. Um, well, Justine has developed our approach in terms of digital health and uh, how digital health can reach most vulnerable populations. And of course, this is not the only approach that we have, of course. Um, the way we deal with that is to have complementary approaches between um, media strategies, digital health strategies and partnership strategies, because uh, all these approaches just make sense in a big puzzle, you know, and they complement each other just to try and reach um, vulnerable groups efficiently. Of course, we have multiple targets. So that's why we try to have partnerships, specific partnerships to reach the unemployed with uh, Pôle emploi. Pôle emploi is a national French structure to deal with the unemployed, but also to reach um, what we target in uh, studies, like, uh, for instance, uh, people from, um, uh, you know, people working in restaurants, bars, hotels, uh, in different fields that we have targeted uh, in order to reach these people. So, yeah, we have we have 
a field approach. We have a national strategy in terms of partnerships and we have a national strategies in terms of social marketing. Fantastic. Is, is, is that Thank okay? You Do you need us to develop? It'd be, it'd be interesting to see that theme of partnerships come up and how, how interventions um, and, and the social marketing is rolled out through partnerships through the twig and learning from that, that'd be fantastic. Yes, I would encourage you to, to, to come to our meeting on Friday, because on Friday we will talk uh, first uh, about COVID. And there was a question in the chat on the COVID and uh, pandemic and uh, the link to uh, tobacco figures. And uh, also we have a part of the session dedicated to Stoptober. And within the French Stoptober, which is called Moi Sans Tabac, we have uh, a strong social marketing strategy with a media strategy, partnership strategy and field strategy. And we'll show you how all these work all together to act uh, against tobacco. So join us. Fantastic. Well, there's a, a, a really great invite for everyone. And I think you've had a few recruits just in the course of this session. So hopefully we'll have a bit more if more people are catching up as well when they if they've not managed to attend this morning. Thanks so much to all our panellists, um, Jennifer, Justine, Sigrid and Jill. That was really fantastic input. Thanks for your time and specialist knowledge. Um, we're very grateful. So I think my task now is to um, hand over to Carolyn and uh, for the, the wind up session. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot, uh, Lorna, for this uh, great session. And uh, I would also like to uh, thank again Santé Publique France uh, for taking the initiative to uh, setting up this uh, thematic working group of your health net on social marketing, which is uh, such an important part of the whole of the health literacy and digital health literacy uh, challenge that, uh, that we are facing. Uh, indeed, your health net uh, started to, to work on digital health literacy in 2018 with this event. Uh, in 2019, we uh, organized a workshop with the Ministry of Health in Portugal uh, on digital health literacy, uh, where we came up with some great uh, recommendations and a policy policy uh, that uh, is also available to you, as I think it's still very much applicable. Um, and uh, we are also a part of the e-health stakeholder group of the European Commission. Um, I think at the time when we started, digital health literacy still felt a bit of a, a new concept, but uh, listening to you all and, uh, and, and all the great work that you have demonstrated here, uh, it shows that the field definitely has advanced a lot, but there's also still so much uh, to do. Um, so before I uh, uh, bring uh, to you my three uh, priorities for action, I would like to give the floor first to Clayton Hamilton. He is uh, the coordinator of the digital health uh, flagship of uh, WHO. And I would like to ask you, Clayton, what are your uh, set of uh, lessons learned or your reflections, let's say, of the topic uh, that you've discussed this morning? <clears throat> thank you very thank you very much Carolina really appreciate it and and good morning good afternoon to all of you I actually thought today's session was extremely rich in content um, and extremely diverse we touched upon many many different topics that um, that I think resonated all of them uh, with me what was most interesting I felt was that we were we were not in a position to really discuss the depth and breadth that we did today even just a few years ago I'll keep going, sorry, a bit of background noise there. So, so much has already happened, um, I think on the, on the back of COVID that has really assisted in bringing some of these issues of digital health literacy um, and digital skills to light. So in amongst all of this incredibly rich content today, there were a couple of things which particularly resonated with me. So I just want to try and tease those out and, and, and recap on them. Again, keeping in mind that I want to do justice to all of the discussions that took place today, but it's very difficult in a, in a short period of time. But firstly, just to reframe, we're looking at today's discussion in terms of primarily looking at um, equity and social different, uh, social uh, socioeconomic differences, um, the role of uh, infodemic and misinformation and false information, um, and how that really impacts. And a couple of things really came out. Firstly, 
uh, framing it in terms of if Europe's digital transition is to be a success, it must work from it for everyone. It's really important to understand that addressing equity and inclusion in accessing health services digitally is really quite multifaceted. And I felt that was one of the really key themes that came out today. And it requires that not only do we address different sets of health determinants, um, but also that we address different components in terms of literacy. And these different components came out um, articulated in slightly different ways by different speakers, but essentially when I tried to capture them, there were digital skills and literacy, there were connectivity, and there was accessibility or what was also called engagement. Um, and this really highlighted also that digital health literacy um, can contribute to decreasing inequalities, uh, including gender-based inequalities and social exclusion, but it's a very fine balance that we need to be very um, acutely aware of. We also heard from uh, Orkin and Alicia that um, very clearly that low levels of literacy can be correlated with low social gradients and vice versa. And I thought that was a very, very key uh, conclusion. There's been a number of research um, efforts done around, but I've never actually seen it captured quite so succinctly as it was today. Um, we know that so the lower social status is less likely, it means people are less likely to access services digitally. Um, and that there's really, I think, now becoming a much clearer understanding of the link between digital inequality and health inequality. Um, we saw also from the survey done in Wales that there was a non-uniform uh, access between population groups, so different challenges based upon different ages, and also that uh, digital exclusion can not only be excluding access to health, but also to a range of other factors as well. Uh, Orkin also highlighted, which I thought was really important, the um, uh, the need for early interventions for literacy, both for children, but also for teachers. Um, and he presented a range of tools that have been developed in Germany, which I felt uh, could be used as a, a so-called blueprint for other countries. And I actually really quite like the Nibbles Health Literacy Training for Adolescents program that uh, he presented. Lars then came in and I uh, felt gave a really good point on um, a much more uh, grassroots community involvement uh, on the use of digital devices. He put forward three main things, purpose, trust, and quality, which uh, again, really resonated with me because I think they're often the intangible perspectives that we really need to address when we're looking at uh, health literacy and the acceptance and uptake of digital solutions by pop populations. I also really just want to highlight some of the fantastic uh, points that came out in our last session here, looking at modern media and marketing approaches in digital health literacy. We saw that really for the first time, the lowest group, uh, there's a clear correlation between a risk of having a long-term condition associated with low levels of health literacy. Again, really starkly putting at front and center the role of digital determinants in, in the um, improvement of health. Um, and also that uh, the digital interventions actually have a really strong cost effectiveness for social media campaigns. And I think that's really important. We don't often look at that in terms of um, health decision makers, in terms of the cost effectiveness of some of these interventions, but they really do, I think, when designed and managed properly can actually have that return. Um, Sigrid, Jennifer and Justine took us through really a whole range of, of different uh, perspectives related to social, social marketing to, to tackle addictions. Um, and I particularly liked um, the way that it was defined in terms of developing activities aimed at changing or maintaining people's behavior to benefit individuals and society. Um, we were taken through three main approaches, behavioral, contextual, and third parties data use in terms of how these are designed. And then I thought it was quite nicely clarified after talking about the importance of the style and content as well. So not just the delivery mechanism, but also the way with the, with these were presented, the language that was used to ensure the greatest uptake. And then really um, touching just finally on the partnerships, I, I personally feel uh, when we look broadly across Europe, there are actually a lot of partnerships between um, digital health and, and uh, well, the digital, the technology and the health. They're quite often um, private sector driven in some countries, but there's also, I would say, non-for-profit or umbrella organizations that try to bridge this divide between these two different areas. But clearly there's, there's more need for more visibility and more outreach from both the digital health community and the health community in, in reaching these. But we saw really some wonderful approaches from our colleagues in Santé Publique in France about complementary approaches between media, looking at digital health strategies, partnership strategies to reach different population health groups. So again, that was a real whirlwind summary of what resonated to me, but I think um, a little bit of time now to reflect on, on the messages and looking back at a, 
a nice summary of today, I think will really help us move this discussion onwards in the future. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks a lot, Clayton, for this uh, impressive summary of uh, all of the speakers. Uh, really uh, well done, and I'm happy uh, to have had you here, and also Natasha, of course, uh, who gave this wonderful keynote at the start. And as you have said, uh, has this memorandum of understanding to work with uh, to work with the WHO. We are very keen to continue to work with you on this uh, on this topic. Um, well, listening to you and to all the speakers, I was also thinking, okay, what are now sort of next steps for us? So what are the actions that, uh, that we can take forward? And I tried to limit myself to three. So first, I think for us, for public health professionals and for public health policymakers, you know, we should be always uh, alert that digital transition can indeed widen the health equity gap rather than close it. So actually we should take health equity impact assessments of all of our digital health solutions as a golden standard to always apply in our work um, and to always advocate that we need to take this health equity impact assessment at heart. Um, and this also refers to, for example, the recovery and resilience funds that the commission talked about. There's a lot of money, a lot goes into digital transition, but this equity impact, uh, distributional effects, that is important to, to assess. And this may also mean that uh, digital solutions may need to be hybrid well, not the digital hybrid, but the solutions need to be hybrid. So online as well as offline services, we may need to give people time, as Lars was saying, and to ensure that they get also letters and uh, opportunities for face-to-face -face contact and so on. So we need to diversify our uh, our solutions to this heterogeneity of, of people out there in age, culture, backgrounds, uh, and, and so on. Uh, secondly, I think that we as public health uh, people, we need to get more involved in discussions around legal actions, around regulatory frameworks for digital services that includes privacy issues, as we talked about, but also the financial reimbursement of apps. Some health apps are really expensive and how we can apply certification labels so that the quality and the reliability is clear for everyone. And that's not an easy field for us, but we need to, um, to be there and to, to indeed also liaise with other actors that we are not familiar to liaise with. A third uh, point is, and that came clearly across all of your great work, we need to continue to develop the body of knowledge on digital health literacy and to develop interventions to evaluate them and to, to take stock of what's out there and to learn and engage. And I hope that your husband has made a start with this uh, seminar and we'll continue on social marketing in, in our technical working group. And as part of that, it's also working with other partners, as we've heard now several times, to learn the perspectives of everyone, that everyone like patients, advocates, uh, civil society organizations, but also the industry, they all come with their own perspectives. And we can also only uh, uh, learn uh, if we work uh, together. Um, so that were my, my three points. And uh, we are now unfortunately coming to the end of the of this session, uh, two minutes uh, early, and so it's quite a good timing. <laughs> So I would like to, uh, first of all, uh, thank uh, everyone for your contribution to the seminar. Of course, we will make a nice report out of this uh, session uh, and we'll share all the PowerPoints online and we will see whether we can also make the video available uh, from the recording. But I would particularly like to thank all of the speakers for your time and for sharing all your expertise uh, with us and with the audience. So thanks a lot for that. I would like to thank the moderators, Moitza, uh, president of Eurohealthnet, but also Alison, Sumina, and Lorna for your wonderful uh, chairing job. Uh, and I want to thank the support of the WHO, of course, and the European Commission for making this event possible. And to all my colleagues from Eurohealthnet, Gabriela, Vania, David, Renault, for all of the important work behind the screens, and not to forget the translators for the interpretation from English to French. And of course, all of you in the audience to stick with us until the very end for all your clever questions and uh, remarks and comments. So thank to you all and um, have a nice day. 
and bon appetit. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.